parts of the former Andes, Caribbean and South America in solidarity for a better future of our people. Thank you for being present today. I'm your master of ceremony. I'm Mr. Sidney Martin. I will start with a, with a poem. Um, I don't call them normally poems. I call them thoughts. So I will start with a thought, a short one for today, for this evening. And uh, with the title, Bon Appetit. Bon Appetit. It's uh, written originally in Papiamento, and I translated it in English for, especially for this evening. Bon Appetit. Guided and brought together by our leaders in charge, today we open our eyes and see that we are in a place where we don't want to be. With little knowledge of our own past, and without any idea of our destiny, the only things that keeps us alive is biting and licking. Biting and licking. We bite our own brothers and sisters while we lick the strangers, believing that he keeps us alive. Biting and licking. Biting and licking is fashionable today. The Bonerians criticizes Bonerians. Families drag each other through the mud. Neighbors fight among themselves and praise someone from whom they don't know from under which stone he crawled from. Even worse, under instructions, our local leaders do all kinds of maneuvers, pranks, biting our own brother, trying to thwart the struggle that he leads for all of us in order to please some foreigners from whom we do not even know their true intentions. This was a starting, starting thought. I now move on to tell something about the Caribbean Progressive Alliance. The Caribbean Progressive Alliance is a group of colonial territories from the French, Dutch, British, United States, and Colombia joined together to form a progressively and collectively fight for the right of self-determination. As CPA is made up of Bonaire, Guyana, French Guyana, or Cayenne, Virgin Islands, us, Puerto Rico, San Andres, Providencia, Centre Stations, Curacao, St. Martin, Stacia, Saba, Aruba, as all our islands have different dependency arrangements and situation, one, a case-by-case -case basis, on a case-by-case -case basis to join and jointly and individually address all decolonization policies on the international stage as the Alliance will be beneficial to our joint efforts, to our organizations, our constituents that we represent by a formal structure cooperation in order to maximize the benefits of our endeavors. For the last six years, the CPA have been working continuously on this mission. And today, six years later, being here, we reached many major milestones as we are part of a global African Congress 
and the reparation chapter, wrote objection letter fighting for the right of self-determination to our colonial rulers and participating in this conference today on reparations. This fuels us with hope and our situation will reach global attention and awareness. Our sixth anniversary of this symposium, we now have six major masters, the French, Dutch, British, United States, and Colombia. Most of us doesn't know of Rizal brothers and sisters suffering because of Colombian rule. I will now introduce my sister, Mrs. Gavika Bizesar Shaw of the organize, organizing committee. Mrs. Gavika. Hi, hello, good morning, welcome, evening. welcome my beautiful people from the Caribbean. How is everyone doing today? Nice to see you. This is our second year by Zoom, so um, I feel a little um, I'm sick from not us being together. In this house, uh, two years ago, we all met, and um, so I feel that you guys should be here. But we have four of us here, so um, we're hoping next year to be all together. Hopefully, let's all work on that. Today is the sixth symposium, and it has, has been a long journey. We had started in 2016 when Dr. Corbin suggested that we have this conference. It's all new to us. And we decided to work under his guidance to start this conference. We never thought that we could have done it. This was the first time in the year uh, to have a conference like self-determination and reparations. Reparations is like a normal topic that's never discussed on our island. And um, today, later on, we'll have a poem explaining of you on reparations. But it was very um, different conference that was ever happened on the near, the right of self-determination. In 2016, Dr. Corbin did a keynote speech. We had various participants from the of ABC Islands, and we had the Honorable Rudy Cruz, who today I would like to say that we have um, lost him. He had passed away two weeks ago, and he was one of our main supporters in the ABC Island. He was the head of the decolonization committee of COPAL, and he was the president, vice president of COPAL. And he said in the last year conference that he would fight until the last sweat and blood of him fight for the right of Bonaire and Constitution, stable self-determination as it was before. But now he is gone and we will keep him in our hearts. And he has a special place. Before he left, he told us, he gave us uh, guidance on what must be done after he left because it was very emotional one year ago. We had a meeting with him in Aruba and he, he sent, lent his hand towards others to help us. And in that, we'd like to thank the island of Aruba for all the support they have given us. And we hope that our friend Rudy Cruz, our hero, rest in peace. So I just want to say thanks again. Everyone met Rudy. He, he did a special conference for us in St. Martin and on behalf of Copal. And most of you met him. Most of you met him in 2016. So after six years, we are still sitting together. We have added the family. We have added, um, we have added French Guyana, Guyana. We have added French, and we also added uh, 
the Bermuda Island, the British uh, part of the, the territories of Britain. So we are very, uh, we are a very progressive group, like Mr. Martin explained. CPA is very, um, very, very important uh, group and instrumental in bringing us together because the colonizer always wanted to separate us. We have no ferries and boats like it ha they have in Europe. We have no, um, no, no planes coming, uh, flights coming out of Africa. We have, we have no way of connecting us. So because of Dr. Corbin and his, um, his forward way of thinking, he had brought us together. So I'd like to thank everyone for being here in our sixth year. And I'd like to also thank uh, Mr. Sidney Martin for standing with us in Tickenton and being our MC for the last four years. Um, thank you so much. And we have a blessed uh, day today and hope that we can have um, nice discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Vicky. Thank you, Mrs. Davika, Mrs. Sar. I will introduce Mr. James Finnis. He is president of the We Want Bonaire Back Foundation, Nosquare Bonaire Back in Papiamento, and vice president of Bonaire Human Rights Organization. James. Finish is well known. Thank you, Davika. Thank you, other friends from the Caribbean um, that are with us this afternoon. Um, we we are here, um, how is that? It's not like this. Caribbean at this moment is at the highest of a joyful um, event that just happened. Barbados. Barbados just take a leap, major leap. That was, um, it's a quiet of that and had um, that, that type of movement for the last, I don't know, decades of since years, decades, was nothing happening on this front of, of, of some kind of move in this self-determination struggle that we are confronting. So as we are congratulating Barbados with this major um, step, is, I call it breaking the chains because there's another mental, I call it mental chains that we Barbados help us to break now is that they, they show that um, there are courageous people in the Caribbean that we are still uh, shouldn't um, think that it's over with self-determination and things like that. So why I'm here today is because of that reason. Why we are here today is because of that reason. Whenever Caribbean was like an in an okay state, because we thought it was okay, we all um, and were um, keep going with our internal struggles in our islands. But that that part of a colonization and the colonization was not on the agenda of our leaders, politicians, in the such. They was not thinking how to fix things, and there was a referendum here, referendum there, but nothing major on the decolonization front. But we, um, like other Caribbean Antilles Islands, on 10, 10, 10, we're set back in time. We were reversed from this road, from this, from this trajectory uh, of emancipation and self-determination. It was reversed. We were reversed back to the beginning. The beginning meaning <laughs> to start all over again. And yes, it is not easy because um, our peoples were not prepared for this. The people doesn't understand much about self-determination and the history is not 
has never been taught to them. So our struggle become double more complicated at this point in time because not knowing your history, not, not knowing um, 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 what you have to stand for, who you are and what you should do with your life. And then on top of it comes the colonizer direct in your house, in your island and start all over new the colonizing you. So for us, this is a very odd moment in our history because our ancestors endured that already. The Caribbean islands endured that. But, but we, I say it today again, meanwhile Barbados is celebrating a major step. We are a complete colony, but not only that, we are bound to be extinct. That's why we're here, because if we had a population, Drake, Aspiro, Sao, and other islands, maybe we can fight for some decades the struggle that everybody has been struggling in the Caribbean, but we don't have the time. We are now in an extinct, uh, exterminative process. This is not, a, this is not a, 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 a just an emotional speech of, of as I want to say back this, uh, our reality on the net. So bad that it is on all fronts. We are on the attack to be extinct on all fronts. Meaning, the first uh, at, uh, is our population is is, is being distributed, is being um, eradicated, eradicated at the, all levels. The first level is the population size. Population size meaning that we our um, immigration, uh, the restriction has been lifted. There's no restriction for Dutch Europeans to migrate. So what happened? Um, our immigration growth of 400% resulted that in less than a decade, yes, we have been reduced to our island to a minority, we are today less than 40%. That is statistics. That is statistics from the statistics office that hide this information for years. And when it was done, meaning when we are in minority, then they published this in 2019. Then the people say, yes, oh, we are talking against the Dutch, we are fighting against the Dutch. No, we are fighting against extinction. That's why we fight it at this moment. For us, self-determination, and we say, is the next step to help us maybe to not be extinct. But we are facing a real, a real uh, uh, process, a, a very, uh, we say, um, high-level institutionalized uh, policy uh, process to be eliminated as one other people. I'm not saying it because um, only about the, the figures we have there. The figures are there, the statistics are there. We, we have no power to do anything as government or on any other platform. We have no representation to, to do no legal action for us at this time. It's just an ongoing process. But then, not only that, because it happens on all fronts, on the cultural front. On the cultural front, meaning our, our people are faced every day with a, I will call it an invasive group, invasive to our native people. They don't know how to cope with a, a, a very aggressive, uh, let's say, a Western of European, uh, 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 type of civilization, because that's what they call them, civilization, um, that are threatening, attacking, trying to change everything in our lives every day. We ourselves are a little, I have more courage to speak up and stand up, um, are doing our best to stand up, to do something about it, exposing here, fighting here, but all the other people that don't have that, 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 that not the courage, the power to fight back are every day a trouble. Every day you, you go on the road, you, you experience several cases of death. 
of the attack of, on our, our way of life and, and suppressing our way of life. And that is happening since then and it continues to happen. So on the field last week, that was a, I can't remember it last week, that was a protest in Bonaire um, where the people see that they have to do something when a Dutch citizen uh, decided that he, he will um, uh, deal with the authorities to stop, uh, to stop, um, to change a vendor that was standing on the street by his house, by his house that he, to move a little bit because there's too much noise of honking cars. And what that means on Bonaire, everybody come say hey, you nice people because everybody gets everybody. Not only that, everybody uh, honk each other as a greeting when we each other. So can you imagine the Dutch <laughs> invader, invader, invasive, go to the authority said the people are honking in my house. So this disturbing the flights of the last, they say in Dutch. Is, 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 is hinder, I call it, um, hinder of noise hinder. So with that, they move the guy. So the island got upset. They, they finally, something touched them. They fight back. They organize a big line of cars. And then they were honking, passing by in front of the house and honking, honking for hours. So I give an example of what I'm telling today is not um, just because we have uh, 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 to say something against the Dutch. No, this is our daily life. So next to that, I go in, for example, on the level of of the. I'm going on the level of the of the um, education. Education has been redirected to keep the Bonarians um, out and extinct them further. Why do we do that? That the education system has to change to the Dutch norms. So that means the Bonarians lose the, what that was for years instilled on this island that they could have followed the education in their own language, one. So that gone, meaning what that resulted is that they are being uh, our local kids with the native language is Papiamento, yes, are being teach in a language that they don't understand nothing about it. That's one problem. But next is when they have to um, uh, go to the secondary um, school, they, they are, um, they are um, evaluated based on the the, um, the, the comprehensive of the Dutch language, the speaking the Dutch language, etc. not on the intellectual capacity. So what happens with that? That most of our people, these, uh, our kids um, are being segregated to lower, to lower a grade. So they, don't make it anymore to the high level secondary schooling. That is a statistic that is happening with us now. So they have no future. So Bonaire people doesn't have a future. That's how I calculate it, right? Because our youth is our future. So if we, our youth cannot uh, get the, the, in, the, in, 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 the, in the school necessary to go high education, so they will not be later the leaders of the island because it's already taken by someone. So that is another point. So on other fronts, for example, um, on the tax system, the tax system has been directed to take Bonaire people um, property from them. Why? Because everybody on our island has, has, um, has um, tax, uh, has land. That is normal. We inherited, we get a piece of land, but with that, um, the tax, the, the land taxes has been raised up to 1,000%, not 100%, not twice, not double, 
of up to 100 plus percent in cases, depending on where you live. So meaning the it's being a rare range, and, and just now the Dutch took over the registry also from the from the island. So they control completely the land registry, and the people are on a high pressure to pay to pay the taxes, land taxes. An example that um, the uh, income of the island, of the, the living standard of the island is way below, half below the minimum standard of, of poverty, poverty line. is below the poverty line, half below the poverty line. So our elderly, mom, for example, the parent, has a house. Plus, we get a house one way or other. But then, the pension is not enough to live, but then on top of it, they raise the taxes. So these people are struggling, fighting to maintain what they have, to keep their land, but not only can maintain land, to live too, because it's way below. We just can see by the news that that in Holland they have a discussion now in the in the parliament, but they say we're gonna raise to the 10% after 11 years. Where we where it has to raise with 70% to come at least at, at the poverty line. So 10 more years with all the costs going on, you survive, you will keep the land. So this is not um, just a simple day for us. We're not come only to say we will have a conference and a yearly conference. This is a daily struggle for us to survive and to as the people. Because Every day pass by, new uh, uh, rules, regulations are being created, new systems are being created on all fronts. The result is to make sure that the Bonarian does not belong on any, on any position because all the island position has been taken by the um, incoming uh, European of even from other islands, they bring people uh, now to put on position. But our kids are studying the same universities, they have the same papers, and everybody around the world, but they cannot come to Bonaire. So this is this is our reality that we are in. And I know um, it, the time is is enough now to for me to start slowing down. Yes. So our main purpose to, to in this struggle is to see if we can save the Bonaire people for a rapid ex extinct. We are bound now to disappear. And this is happening on a daily basis. I know um, you know, some people in the Caribbean will well, um, Royce de France, oh, we never heard about it. Yes, we never heard about it because even on Curacao, on Aruba, this is not being, media doesn't deal with this. So we have to do this. We have to keep coming out. We have to reach out and help us to spread this message throughout the Caribbean, throughout the world, because they have to save the Bonaire people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finis. Our next speaker will talk about the advantages of being an autonomous territory in contemporary Caribbean. Dr. Ludeska Livingstone. Dr. Ludeska Livingstone is a psychopedagogue with a Master of Science in Special Education. She is a specialist in leadership and has a diploma in social management for development. She is delegated by the uh, Providencia Island to the National Space for prior consultation of the Black Afro-Colombian Razels and Palanqueras communities and is an active leader in our community. 
She has practiced the profession of educator for the elementary school level from the elementary school level to the university level. Dr. Ludeska Livingstone. Uh, yes, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, hello, nice. It's nice seeing you guys even online after so long. Um, well, um, this evening, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking a little about the advantages of um, being an autonomous territory in the Caribbean. Well, autonomy is. I consider that it's something given from God. Um, we, we all have the right to be autonomous and to take our own decision. If we go back to the book of Genesis from the beginning of, that is recounted in the Bible, there was a mandate for a man to subdue and uh, govern the earth, but there was no mandate for a man to, to govern over man or to subdue any, any person. Unfortunately, um, during the history of man, evil come into the heart of man and they started dominating and wanted to oppress each other. Autonomy is a God-given right, and it is um, recognized by the UN and by other international legislation and agreements. However, many people doesn't have the privilege to enjoy this um, these rights, and. The future of our Caribbean in terms of self-determination is not so bright. As you can see over the last day, days, there have been a lot of interruption because people are feel like they are not enjoying this right and they are not free. This is not um, just about um, wanting to to um, to raise up against the government, but definitely man has that feelings. He have that inner need to be free and to take their own decision. No one want other people to take decision for them. Self-determination allow for some advantages and many people with many scholars have the idea that they are more disadvantaged to self-determination and autonomy than what advantage, but I see the contrary. For me, there is more advantage than disadvantage. And um, in the Caribbean, which is a very strategic or geostrategic territory, um, meaning everybody want to, to put their hand in the Caribbean right now, because of the advantage that it, it is for them. I think we need to, to make more decision about what we want, who we want to be, and where we are going. And if we, if we are going to do that, we need to be more 
autonomous. We need to make decision for ourselves. So some of the advantages that self-determination and autonomy brings are, for example, autonomy over internal affairs. In the people of the territory decide what they what goes on in their territory. Um, if we look around in the Caribbean, I'm speaking for our ter territory right now. After Hurricane Ayota, the Colombian government came down and took over, <laughs> took over the territory. Um, they imposed, or they wanted to impose um, themselves upon the people. They did not look forward to building houses and hospital before they start building militaries, military bases and stuff like that. So in, if we were an autonomous and territory and had all our rights in place to make our own decision, this wouldn't have happened. We could have said no, even though we are still fighting the situation, they, would have, they wouldn't have gone that far. Another um, advantage of having autonomy and self-determination is that political autonomy. People, when people enjoy political autonomy, they are the one who decides who they want to elect in there as their leader. In, in many of our Caribbean territories that are not autonomous, the metropolis is who decide who is going to lead. Um, for example, we, we look at uh, San Andres and Providence, even though they pretend that we have such a um, democracy, elections are manipulated from Bogota. And so they are the ones who decide who are elected in our territory for governor, for alcalde. We don't even have at this point our own political parties. In other territories, um, you enjoy the, the rights to establish political party. We don't have any political party of our own. All of them are political parties from the mainland or from Colombia. Another advantage is fiscal autonomy. When you enjoy fiscal autonomy, um, the territory decides how they spend their money and they also decide what their budget is spent on. In many of the territories in the Caribbean, that is not so. Um, well, you guys heard James talk about Bonier. The metropolis is who decide what the budget is going to be. And one of the things that they that they keep telling people is that if you become autonomous, you may see yourself being Haiti tomorrow. That is not true. Many of the territories in the Caribbean enjoy the privilege of sending more money to the metropolis than what they really come back to them. As small as our territory is, um, the Colombian government has never ever give us an information on how much money is collected in our territory. 
we don't enjoy the the benefits from any type of agreement around our territory where there is exploitation of natural resources. The, the, the agreements of these types are signed in Bogota with other countries and um, we don't know how much the Colombian government benefit from that. We don't know how much they collect for those agreements and they never tell us or they never send back money from those agreements to us. And I guess that's something that is happening all around the Caribbean. Um, I know for sure that um, these guys in Bonaire with their salt mine or their salt production, they really don't I get a full idea of how much money is um, entering the budget from, from those exploitation of natural resources. Um, another advantage of being autonomous is the re relational aut autonomy. Um, relational autonomy refers to the territory deciding who, who establish the, who they establish relationship with and they also manage their own international affairs. As you can notice, um, in our case, here in San Andres and Providence, we can't even make the decision to visit our families in, in Nicaragua. When the Colombian government um, decided to exert more pressure on us, they cut off our, our relationship with our neighbors. So we used to travel back and forth freely from Nicaragua to here um, or from here to uh, Honduras and, and our neighbors around. And now we can't do that. For someone, for some of our family in Nicaragua to come here, they have to get a visa. Um, still Nicaragua has an open door for Raisal people to go there and visit their family. But the Colombian government, uh, in the name of um, exercising um, their power over us, they decided to cut all relationship with our neighbors. So it's not possible for someone to, to go freely, for example, to Jamaica, Nicaragua, Honduras, from here, you have to go through a lot of um, red tapes. Sometimes you have to go Bogota, you have to go Miami, and then go where you want to go, or Panama. So things that used to be as easy as getting into a, a boat and going to Karen Island, it's not as easy anymore. So if we had the possibility to decide on our own destiny, those things wouldn't have happened. We could go freely because I believe that um, the way the, the Caribbean was before, it was um, like a family thing. So family get up from here, they go to Limon, they go um, Panama, they go Nicaragua. They are, they are a town in, in, in Panama and in Costa Rica where it's on all the, the people there are people from Providence, you know, all their relatives are descendant from here. But when that tie was cut, some of us even lost the connection with our relatives. So we, we don't even know them anymore. And I am sure that these are things that are happening in the Caribbean with close by islands that are 
uh, I would say, inhabited by relatives, and still they can't visit each other because of the 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 um, different nations or different metropolis that are governing these islands. So um, I think that it it also creates a really really um, bad a traumatic emotional ties because people can um, get to to do as they used to do before. We we don't even know ourselves anymore. Um, another advantage that we we can um, we can refer to in being um, autonomous is the restoration of identity and the end of indoctrination um, by managing our own educational system. If you notice in the Caribbean, almost none of our non-self-governing territories don't have a educational structure by themselves. It's something that is passed down from the metropolis. Um, so all these educational designs by these, um, I would say, supranational um, institutions, they are set up for us. And, and proof of that is that almost none of us has an educational system that is structured in our own language. For more than 30 years, uh, San Andres and Providence has been uh, pushing to create an educational system for themselves. And it, was, it is not allowed on, to this moment by the Colombian government. So all our, our children, they have limitation in languages because they come from home with a language, they go to the school, and they meet another language. And majority of the time, the material that they are reading come in the language of the metropolis. And children have limited comprehension of those materials. So they are almost, I would say, dumbing down our, our children in the material that they send to us, the reading material especially, majority of it is set up to indoctrinate our, our children um, and take away identity from them. So if you listen to many of these children who are currently going to school, you will see that instead of they identifying themselves with their own people, they are talking about their um, Colombian, or maybe they, they'll say, well, they are British or whatever. People think that the identification and identity is the same. Because that is what they are teaching them um, in, in this material. If you search through it, you'll see that it, there is no reference to the territory as such. Um, someone was asking, in a chat on Facebook this morning, how many people went to, to schools and were taught Caribbean history? I cannot make reference of any moment in my life where I saw um, in school Caribbean history. Many of the Caribbean territories right next to us don't know that San Andres and Providence exists. And if you ask many people in the Caribbean right now, if there are still colonial activities going on in the Caribbean, they will tell you no, because they really don't know. No one is telling them that. No one is telling them that there is still colonial activities, no one is telling them that there is territories that are not autonomous in the Caribbean. And I think this is very important and we have to recap. 
Um, there are scholars out there who are saying that um, autonomy is disadvantageous. And the, the reason that they give is that the territories are lacking resources and they will not be able to, to, um, to maintain themselves and so on and so on. But I think there is more advantages to be autonomous than disadvantages. You don't, you don't necessarily have to be who become like Haiti. And for me, Haiti is, a, is, is, is the way the country is managed and the way they, they set up. So um, even if you have little resources, there are countries who, are, who have little natural resources and they are rich countries. So I think it's all about ideology, idiosyncrasy, vision, and um, the way you manage your, your territory. Um, I would stop there if anyone wants to ask any question. Yeah. So. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you guys very much. I think it's, did I? No, can I, can I say something? I, I don't necessarily have a question, but what I want to say to you, I appreciate the presentation and the template that you reference is the exact same template that is used in our space as well. And I will talk about that a little later, but yeah, thank you because it, it making the connection and making it real for a lot of people, we really appreciate it. So I took some, some notes and I will get back at some point okay. in touch with Dr. Livingstone. You are welcome. I like to remind everybody that we have a, a section, a Q and A section uh, later on. So um, write down your questions, and then when we get to that point, um, you, can, you can ask your question and uh, also stay to whom you have a question to. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lodeska. Livingstone, thank you very much. Our next speaker is also very well known. He will talk about contemporary colonialism in the Caribbean. He will um, give us an overview. His name is Dr. Carlisle Carbon. Dr. Carlisle Corbin, as I'm checking his bio, he sent us a very short bio. Dr. Carlisle Corbin is an international advisor on governance and senior fellow in the Global Dependency Studies Project Think Tank. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Guam and has served as an independent expert to the United Nations. He is the former Minister of External Affairs for the uh, Virgin Islands, Virgin Islands US government. He lectures globally on dependency governance and self-determination and is the author of numerous scholarly articles and several books. Dr. Carlisle Carvin. Good afternoon. I thank you uh, very much for, thank you very much for the kind words that have been expressed to me um, at the beginning of this sixth symposium. 
I listened very intently to what was said by both James and Odeska. And uh, it really does create our situation, gives it very much a very serious tone to it. Uh, that is purposely, I would like to thank you all for convening this symposium and certainly James and Davika and others for the efforts you have made in keeping us together through these annual meetings. I'd like to join also with you in honoring the memory of our brother, Rudy Cruz, who was a consistent advocate for the decolonization of the Caribbean in his work both in Aruba and elsewhere. I appreciate this opportunity to share a few thoughts on the subject at hand, the contemporary colonialism in the Caribbean. The overall situation in our region continues to be increasingly complex. And many of us have developed different strategies to respond to the contemporary colonial dynamic as it is played out in all of our territories individually and collectively. I have said many times that the Caribbean has the most diversified colonial arrangements than any place in the world in such a small geographic space. We are indeed the remnants of empire. Recent developments in the Pacific show that contemporary colonialism is very much a global challenge requiring a global response. We, knew, we know that these dependency arrangements, we know them all too well. And over the years, we have learned that it is useful to address these challenges together. To the extent possible, we should continue to support each other in the various tactics which we may choose to challenge contemporary colonialism. We should also take care that any differences on strategy we may have is not used by others to confuse us. Our intent is to increase awareness of our people, and this is strengthened through our collective solidarity. This is why this conference each year is so very important. We can compare notes, discuss different ways to advance our individual and collective decolonization process. Recent developments have shown that the situation in many of our territories continues to evolve. And I'll just make a few points on this as in moving forward. For the six territories administered by the United Kingdom, Bermuda, Turks and Caicos Islands, Cayman, Montserrat, Anguilla, British Virgin Islands. The withdrawal by the British from the European Union has resulted in an even more intense effort to control these territories. I hopefully, uh, Member of Parliament of Bermuda, uh, Mr. Uh, Thomas Amos, uh, a famous, is with us and he will uh, expand on that. There's also the ongoing effort to convince the United Nations that these British territories are examples of legitimate self-government. A few of the British territories are contesting this, what we refer to as colonial legitimization. And they are, and they are insisting on a genuine process of self-determination. All six of these British territories are on the United Nations list of non-self-governing territories. But the United Nations, including the independent Caribbean countries that are member states of the United Nations, need to do more, much more, if decolonization is to be achieved under Article 73 of the United Nations mandate. This is international law. All the countries that are signatories to the United Nations Charter have an international legal obligation to advance these territories to the full measure of self-government. Meanwhile, the two United States administered territories, which have been referred to earlier, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, seem to be moving in different directions. Puerto Rico has well-organized movements to achieve full self-government, either through political integration on the one hand, or sovereignty on the, other, on the other hand. At the same time, the forces of the current dependency status in Puerto Rico have lost much of their support. Legislation has been introduced in the US Congress 
to provide for U.S. statehood, or alternatively, a, con a constituent assembly, which would provide the people with an opportunity to select between integration, free association, or independence. My own Virgin Islands, us, as we have become to refer to it, on, uh, has embarked on an internal process to endorse the colonial law imposed on us in 1954. As many of you may know, we have tried five times to agree a local constitution because the power sought by the people in the constitution would have to be granted by Washington. This is precisely the reason why the five efforts have failed because in fact, the powers that we seek would not be granted as a colony. So have we chosen colonialism by consent? Is colonialism by consent colonialism nevertheless? Sometimes it's better to know some of the questions than all the answers. Now, with respect to French administered Caribbean, Guadeloupe, Martinique, and Cayenne, these are the French departments in the region and also the French administered collectivities of St. Martin and St. Bartholomew, St. Bart. There has been an intensification of an ongoing struggle against social and economic inequality in the relationship with France. As we know, this is often met by violence from French security forces. Videos of the recent extensive demonstrations in Guadeloupe, Martinique, and Cayenne over social media have shown the intensity of this struggle. We remain painfully aware of this through the injustices endured by progressive forces in Cayenne. We have seen the disturbing photos on this point. We have seen the disturbing photos in San Andres. Our sister Corinne has been affected by this tremendously. The, the struggle in the French administered Caribbean, as it does in the French dependencies of the Pacific, Kanaki, Maui, Nui, are all connected. It's, it's a part of a global decolonization initiative. This brings us to the Dutch administered Caribbean with the three public entities of Bonaire, Seba, and Stasia, St. Eustatius. The findings of our recent self-governance assessment of Bonaire confirm the social, economic, and political inequality governing this status. You heard much of the particular questions on this issue when James Feeney in his, in his statement earlier. This is not self-government. The strategy of UN reinscription, reinscription for Bonaire on the United Nations has been undertaken by James Finney and his group within Bonaire. There's, a, there's an alternative strategy which provides for legal proceedings in the Dutch courts. This has been undertaken uh, primarily by Clive and Putin of Stasia. Both of these initiatives are critical, critically important in raising the issue in European and global circles. We also take note that the new human rights organization in Bonaire has filed complaints with several human rights mechanisms. So these issues being challenged on many fronts. Meanwhile, there are also developments in the three Dutch administered semi-autonomous countries of St. Martin, Aruba, and Curaçao. A 2012 self-governance assessment of Curaçao confirmed political inequalities of that status only two years after the dismantling of the former Netherlands Antilles, which of course comprised five islands at that time. Former, a follow-up assessment on Curaçao, if were to be undertaken, could provide an updated assessment of the situation as it exists in 2021, 2022. Meanwhile, one of the NGOs in Curaçao has recently written to the United Nations Fourth Committee questioning whether the former Netherlands Antilles was properly removed from the United Nations list in 1955. This is an opinion shared by a similar non-governmental organization in St. Martin. 
Speaking of St. Martin, this parliament has filed a complaint with the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, while a prominent non-governmental organization has filed a series of cases in the Dutch courts challenging whether the former Netherlands Antilles was fully decolonized. Meanwhile, as we heard from Sister Lodeska, the Raisal people as the native people of San Andres, Providencia, and Santa Catalina, administered by Colombia, have taken important initiatives through policy statements, demonstrations, and other direct action. There are also ongoing negotiations with the Colombian government on a statute that would provide the recognition of the Raisal people within the framework of the Colombian constitution. Alternatively, a general, a genuine process of self-determination is being discussed. These and other developments are indications that will be, elaborate, will be elaborated upon by later speakers today. My purpose here then is merely to highlight what we already know, that the era of colonialism is by no means complete in our hemisphere. It has only become increasingly complex. Now, you may have seen the recent letter from St. Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez to the Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley on the occasion of Barbados becoming a republic. In this letter, Prime Minister Gonzalez made reference to the importance of ending colonialism in the Caribbean. He emphasized that initiatives on decolonization should be taken by the people of the territories themselves. Well, Caribbean leaders should know that such initiatives are being undertaken as I had described earlier and which we will hear more of today. There are many more actions underway or being considered, but it must be emphasized that our struggle will be greatly enhanced through the diplomatic and political support of the Caribbean and Pacific countries in the United Nations and other international organizations. To this end, the efforts of James and Davika in particular in their continued approach the CARICOM countries and to the CARICOM secretariat deserve our full support. Without full decolonization of the entire Caribbean, regional integration would be a continued challenge. I would argue that reparations for colonialism must be addressed within the regional and global framework of the, of the reparations movement. With that, I wish to thank you for this opportunity to share some thoughts I look forward to listening to our distinguished presenters. Thank you, Dr. Carbon. Thank you, Dr. Carbon. We will Now move to our first panel of this evening uh, about initiatives and future strategies for self-determination of Caribbean and Southern American territories. Uh, we will have in the panel, it's a panel of three um, very important uh, speakers, very important representatives. We will have from St. Martin, uh, Ms. Rhonda Arindel. We will have from San Andres Providencia, Mr. Edmiston Williams Nelson. And from Guyana, Cayenne, Mr. Maurice Pindert. I will start by introducing Ms. Rhonda Arindel. Ms. Rhonda Arindel. She was born in Curacao and raised in St. Martin, St. Martin, to a mother from St. Vincent and a father from St. Martin. 
1985, she began her university studies at the University of Miami. And in 1989, graduated from C. Radius University in New York with a bachelor's degree in linguistics. That year, 1989, she returned home and was employed at the University of St. Martin, coordinating the English as a second language program and teaching English. In 1996, she obtained a pre-law diploma in Dutch, they call it a propodeus, from the University of the Netherlands and Tillys in Curaçao, while working as the community outreach and prevention officer for Turning Point, a drug rehabilitation center and an editor for the Chronicle newspaper. In 2005, she obtained a Master of Arts in Education administration from the University of the Virgin Islands while heading up the language humanities division at the University of St. Martin. From 2010 till 2012, she served as St. Martin's first minister of education, culture, sports, and youth affairs in the UPDP coalition government. She graduated from the University of Puerto Rico in 2011 with a doctorate in English, specializing in Caribbean linguistics. Since leaving office, she continued to work as a consultant and currently work as an assistant professor of English at the University of the Bahamas. She's the owner operator of the now dormant soil source of inspiration and learning, book cafe and United Academy. Ms. Ronda Arindel. Good afternoon um, and welcome and thanks for this opportunity. I just wanna make a correction. My name is Rhoda, 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 Rhoda. Um, because I know Vicky too has a little challenge there. It's, it's Rhoda, not Rhonda. Um, so thanks for that opportunity to speak with you here. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things. So I know we have a lot to discuss, but um, I come here today as a concerned Caribbean citizen. It was important for me that the link, my Caribbean linkage be made known for the discussion. So. As a concerned Caribbean citizen, though I am the secretary of the Independence for St. Martin Foundation and uh, the chair of the newly established One SXM Association, whose objectives are to represent the 37 square mile area that we live on, right? Politically, culturally, financially. And I say this because our island keeps being grouped according to the French and the Dutch but in reality, we are one people. So I, and for me, this is important to make this distinction. And so, so when the French and the Dutch states permanently settled in St. Martin in 1848, they, and divided our, in 1648, and divided our island among themselves, they did so in their own interest, right? Not in the interest of the people, at the time, the majority of whom were, you know, enslaved Africans who would not experience legal emancipation until 1848, so 200 years after this, by the French and by the Dutch state in 1863. And since that time, the island has been a part of a host of different constellations, but all with the purpose of servicing Europe and to fulfill the European agenda in the region and has nothing to do with the people. And this has not changed over the years. And, and at this moment, there's no denying anymore, you know, that colonialism gave birth to capitalism and that today the Caribbean continues to play a central role in furthering notions of disaster capitalist 
with recent examples in St. Martin serving as, 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 as prime example, actually. And I want to highlight two of those for the sake of our conversation here. Um, in the context of the Netherlands Antilles, because again, before I, I, I started, you know, when I got the invitation and we looked at it, you know, that, that, that notion of, you know, reuniting the former Netherlands Antilles touched a bone. And, I, and, I, and I'll get back to that and you'll see why. It just feels awkward and off to us, but we'll get back to that. And so what I'm saying is that in the context of the Netherlands Antilles, um, at one point, St. Martin was grouped in the SSS Islands. So trying to group Saban Station, St. Martin as a constellation, even in the context of the Netherlands Antilles. And so we've watched those, like today you have the best, you know, Bonaire, Estacia, for no reason, just because the Dutch feel like it. They, they, they group them together. And, and so today St. Martin finds itself in a conversation that's called CAS. Kurosawa, Aruba, and, and St. Martin. Um, another attempt, but simply to facilitate the Netherlands administration of the islands, but effectively for us in St. Martin, further dividing the St. Martin people, who I said already are one people and one family. So while we in St. Martin agree, at, at least at the Independence of St. Martin Foundation and the 1SXM Association, while we have agreed and we commit to further collaborating with all people in order to secure justice for the region, we denounce all attempts to group us into any constellation that we have not chosen to join freely. And I think that has to be clear. Um, the Netherlands has used the opportunity, as I said before, of these two recent disasters to push through further control of the island and perpetuate its colonization of St. Martin. And Dr. Carbon just made mention of some challenges the French state is having with its overseas territories and collectivities these days. But St. Martin is also at the forefront of that conversation with, at the moment, demonstrations in the street and the burning of, of building vehicles and, and placing of rocks in the streets and blocking, you know, um, access to our people, but in effect, protesting the French state as we speak today. And so I wanna look at Hurricane Louis in, in 1995 and um, Irma in 2019, just to, to give a, 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 a difference. In, in 95, when the hurricane came, there was a committee put in place and you know, money would go directly into this new committee that would oversee the reconstruction of the island and not a cent would go into government's coffers, but the money would be administered in a way that showed transparency, made sure that we, because we were hit by a category five hurricane in 1995, practically obliterated, but were able to bounce back as a people. And then again, in 20, 2017, actually not 2019, we were hit by another hurricane, some say category seven, because it, it was beyond what was on the scale. And the response is very different. And it's been very different based on a lot of developments in the region. And so what we saw is what our then government referred to as the indecent proposal by the Netherlands. And what our government at the time was told that you accept a Dutch imposed integrity chamber, you give a border control of the island or get out of the kingdom. But if you want to receive assistance for hurricane recovery, you needed to accept these two proposals. And after a whole lot of back and forth, eventually the government caved and we have lost border control and we now have an integrity chamber that does not operate in the most in integrity manner, but it's here. Um, what do we have as the recovery from Hurricane Irma? We have a number of, of projects that have been decided upon by a, a steering committee put in place by the, the Dutch government, you know, not, not according to what our wishes are, because our recovery can only be done from the Netherlands or with the Netherlands um, direction. So 
We have a steering committee that consists of two persons from the Netherlands and one from St. Martin. They decide which are the, the, the projects that are, that, that are priority areas. They have put in place, uh, World Bank is managing it. So World Bank gets out of the 500 million, about 92 million to manage this recovery. And there is a now something called the National Recovery Planning Bureau that is in place. And it's an office set up for seven years that will manage the recovery of our hurricane in 2017. And according to the projects and some of them that you, uh, we have a, a, a trust fund period for seven years, we have $553 million um, pledged um, 10 projects that have been identified by the Dutch and by the steering committee. And at least three projects are up to 65 million US dollars. What are some of the projects that are there? Airport terminal reconstruction still has not started, but there's some construction here and there, but our main recovery um, and reconstruction of our airport has not really started. Um, digital government transformation, emergency debris management, emergency recovery, income support and training, et cetera. But all of these are projects aimed at access to data, access to financing, re -re revamping of our financial structure because the Netherlands says it has to happen this way. Um, with regards to COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, a number of conditions in order to get support in the form of loans. But as a, as a, as a territory that is supposedly autonomous, I heard Dr. Livingston make reference to it and I thought that interesting, it's supposedly autonomous, but um, in order to get liquidity support during the pandemic, there are a number of other conditions and other things that needed to be given up. Among them, our civil servants and employees of semi-government organizations have had to accept a 12.5% cut in their, in their income, 25% um, reduction in the total um, package for wage benefits, and a whole number of things that up to today are still being heavily contested. Um, but that's where we are. We had to agree to a draft kingdom law on COHO, which is um, an entity that has been set up. It hasn't been passed in parliament yet, but it has been set up because it's actively being implemented on the ground, even though the law has not yet come to parliament here, but it will in all intents and purposes, it looks like it will bypass parliament and all of its decision-making. We, our government had to agree to the proposed country packages, assignment of the financial sector, audit supervision, in addition to what's already there by the CFT, overview of modernization of legislation in the financial sector, um, plan of action for screening of education. And, and that's in itself a discussion how our education system is about to revamp from the Netherlands with, with the Netherlands directing the changes in education in St. Martin, um, whose people, by the way, are English speaking people. And specific to St. Martin, um, guarantee the execution of the payroll support. But as of April 1st, 2021, these country packages are being executed on the ground. And as I said, we have not yet had the discussion of the law to approve the COHO come to the parliament in St. Martin. Um, out of that, we now are on our eighth disbursement of loans from the Dutch government, totaling 262.2 million guilders, 140 plus million dollars that the couple of um, generations will now have to pay because these are loans to help us get through the pandemic as partners within the kingdom. Um, where do we see or how do we see this conversation for 
steps towards re further regional conversation. And this is, again, I'm saying members who are part of the Independence for St. Martin Foundation and members who are part of the One SXM Association. Um, we are at a point where we are now trying to get the political leadership to at least agree on a common mission moving forward in our efforts to, to fight the Dutch. Because um, um, Mr. Corbyn just outlined a number of claims that have been filed. I don't think any of them are being respected. We don't know how much food that is going to bear, any of them. But where we are, it's a matter of, some of us are seeking a referendum, um, a referendum for political independence. And our mission is to get the referendum passed, at least get the political leadership to agree to champion independence in the referendum to exit the kingdom. We do not wanna be a conversation of any constellation within the kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, and for us, reparations must be a part of this package and this discussion. We would like, we could see ourselves becoming full members of CARICOM, ACS, OECS, et cetera. Um, but we don't think that it's something we can strive towards while we're still a colony within the Dutch kingdom. Um, and in, in, in closing, what I'd like to say is that despite failed past attempts at greater Caribbean integration, that I personally believe that we must use every opportunity available to push for greater integration and cooperation as a Caribbean people. Um, for me, St. Martin's interest and for the people who are in my group, our interest cannot be tied to a constellation of former or not Netherlands Antilles. Um, we believe, at least in the case for St. Martin, it must be full political independence with a republic status. We just talked about Barbados and their new status, but even if our status does not align in the same, because there are some proposals here by some of our members as to what our republic would look like, but not necessarily in the same vein, but in nonetheless a republic but a full commitment to participate in, in, in regional development. We believe that we have a voice and we have a lot to contribute to the region. And at the moment, we don't have a voice. We cannot speak to the region. The Dutch speaks on our behalf. The Dutch talks about their neighbors in the Caribbean and they engage in, in treaties that are not in our interest, not, not to our benefit. So we believe that in order for us to be able to speak fully and with our own voice that we cannot be a part of the constellation of anything, whether it's the, the Republic of France or the Dutch. We also believe that um, in our case, as it's always been with our history, that maybe one side of the island may have to go before the next. And we probably will be the, the Southern part that is often referred to as a Dutch side may have to go, but we believe that once that happens, the other side will get full status, full citizenship members, our, our brothers and sisters from the other side. Either way, however it happens, we are prepared to go all the way. And um, I agree with Dr. Uh, with Norman Gervin's 2012 recommendation, I would say, for a Caribbean union or something similar which would provide dependent ter territories like St. Martin, an option of association. Um, we've tried the CARICOM thing. Um, some of us disagree there, but for whatever reason, as we work towards our independence and we are working actively on this, we think we can contribute, as I said, to the region. We wanna be a part of whatever, but we don't wanna be a part of it if it means bringing the Netherlands also in. Um, through the back door or France. And so we would have to figure out how dependent ter territories like St. Martin can still be a part of directly without, because the Netherlands still is responsible for foreign affairs and they always speak at these organizations on our behalf. So those are my points to contribute to the discussion this afternoon. Um, once again, thanks for this opportunity. I look forward to hearing the questions. Thank you, Ms. Rhoda. Thank you very much.
our next uh, representative part of the panel is Mr. Edmiston Williams Nelson. Mr. Edmiston Williams Nelson graduated from the Dallas Baptist University in Dallas, Texas. He is married to Ishia Howard and they both have two kids. He currently is member of the Amen SD movement, a movement that exists to defend the rights of the racial people, people in terms of sustainable development, self-determination and reparation. Mr. Edmiston Williams Nelson. Hello. Um, well, once again, we are together after a hiatus with this whole issue of um, COVID-19. This afternoon, um, I will participate in the name of the AMNSD and the different members that are right now on this panel as well. So uh, to my extended brothers and sisters that I've met in Bonaire, I worked with them. I want to say good evening to all of you. Good evening to you. Good to see Mr. James Finesse. Um, I don't see Ms. Davika, but she's a special one as well for us. Um, so all of those that are sharing this piece um, and this discussion on the malady of colonialism among us as Caribbean people, uh, for which our islands are not exempt. There we go. All right, I get to see her. <laughs> All right, uh, our island is not only uh, exempt from this malady of colonialism, the islands of San Andres, Old Providence and St. Catalina. We are also partakers of said malady, which is colonialism. For that purpose, I would like to be able to express um, our concern and our view on the issue of colonialism in our context. In our context, colonial, colonialism for the right of people and our territory respectively has given birth or rise to the malady that we call overpopulation. So the malady of overpopulation. By overpopulation, um, I mean the um, 27 square kilometers of island has exceeded her carrying capacity, uh, which is causing the current maladies we are experiencing currently the lack of resources reaching the entire population, primarily the Raisal population or Raisal people, acts of intolerance and violence among our Raisal people. Um, they will make you think that these acts of um, intolerance and violence are promoted among ourselves, but in reality, they are a result or a direct result of colonialism that is tied with um, overpopulation. So the rise of uh, overpopulation has affected us tremendously as Rizal people in the, in the um, framework of um, lack of resources among our people. Um, with the rise of uh, Hurricane Iota, Hurricane Iota and Hurricane Eta, we have evidence and we have seen how the lack of resources among our people and using us as a people as a piggy bank to get uh, international resources and funds um, to promote colonialism, specifically on the island population. Now, in light of this particular malady of overpopulation that has given birth to a plethora of viruses spreading on the territory currently. So the following, I want to highlight some of the maladies that we are facing as a result of the colonialism that we have been experiencing. So technically my participation um, this afternoon is to give you guys an overview, um, a general overview of what the island of San Andres, Old Providence and Catalina are currently experiencing and going through as the result of the vestige of colonialism that is affecting us um, immediately. One of the things that I want to highlight for your um, understanding in light of what we are experiencing with colonialism as a result of the overpopulation is the virus, what I call the virus of corruption. Uh, 
St. Andrews has become a very corrupt island. And it is unfortunate for us, even myself, to say that uh, the vast majority of our people are also involved in these acts and these practices of corruption. Now, let me give a, a perspective on this because it's very important. The Raisal people, both nationally and locally, at one point, uh, we were considered, even by the Colombians, as people of high value um, in the context of moral and respect and honesty. But now our island has become, um, as a result of the overpopulation that we are experiencing, our island has become so entrenched in this practice of corruption that the transparency and fairness that was uh, part of the characteristic of the Raisal people are no longer part of what we have as value. And one of the work that we are trying to construct through the different medias that we um, use from Monday through Friday is to develop that, that habit and identity of our Raisal people, to rediscover ourselves and rediscover our values so that we will not get entrenched and involved in this sort of practice that is being promoted nationally. It's not only um, something locally, but it's something strategic and systemic. Um, the corruption that we are experiencing here is very strategic and systemic. It has not become uh, part of our people's DNA to join within this whole political philosophy of doing the way how we practice um, politics today. And the reason why this is so um, tempted to uh, the vast majority of our uh, people is because of the gains that they can receive. So the individual has now become so uh, so big that they forget the community. So those are some of the alteration that is happening as a result of the colonialism that birthed um, overpopulation is actually changing um, the the the, the the community changing the people, not only um, intellectually, but also uh, when we come in the context of our community. So the strategy that the nation has used to cement this uh, corruption and to begin to uh, discriminate or dethrone the people, the right side people, is to point their finger saying that, oh, you guys are corrupt, so we need to elect um, people from the mainland, people that are not right side people, to see if there could be some changes to all of this experience. So no longer the rights of people have the dominant um, say or the dominant participation in the political arena uh, because they are pointing finger at the rights of people as the corrupt. So that is a part of the um, strategy and system that they are using in order to, um, to push aside the rights of people from one side of the power that they had at one particular time. So it is a systemic practice. It is a, a a uh, uh, very um, well thought practice from the um, Colombian um, system in order to promote this kind of practice among the rights of people. So the first virus is the virus of corruption, which is kind of um, disintegrating our society and disintegrating us as a people. The other one that I have noticed and I have been able to analyze is the, the virus of discrimination. The rights of people are being discriminated on their very territory, on their own territory. I mean, on their own territory, the right side people are being considered to be the last person that can have a voice and that can have a vote on matters that pertain the territory, on matters that concern the people and their territory. They don't consult the right side people anymore. Even all of the negotiations that we have been uh, constructing with the national government to be able to secure uh, what we call a right side statue, even so they are discriminating us. When we put our opinion and we put a draft within what we want for the territory, they say that can't go. So uh, even so we are experiencing that discrimination. So uh, they, they have been constructing recently what they call work table to discuss the rights of people that are coming from for instance, for example, recently we have people coming in, uh, X amount, a number of people are coming in from Venezuela, and they are making work tables to incorporate them within uh, the society, the rights of territory and their society. And the rights of people cannot strike a negotiation table with the national and even 
the local government. So in that sense, the rights of people are being discriminated totally from their own, within their own territory. But we also see that they have been making uh, a lot of uh, negotiation and alliances uh, with victims that are uh, being uh, affected by the armed violence in Colombia. And they are relocating them from the mainland Colombia to an island that is limited in space, that the carrying capacity has exceeded in numbers. Uh, since 2014, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Mr. Harry and Ms. Corrine will uh, compliment on that later on in our Q&A. Since 2014, or even before 2001, they have made a census on the island. And since that period, the island still have 50 or 30 or, I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of forgetting my data right now, but if I'm not mistaken, it's like 50,000 people. It has not exceeded that every year the island has not exceeded its number of uh, people uh, on the island, meaning nobody's born, nobody's, uh, nobody's uh, is, they are not giving birth anymore. Life is not uh, being produced on the island. So that's what they are giving the international community to understand that everything is good and everything is going well on the island among the right side people where we are dying. And in the words of our great um, prophet by the name of Bob Marley, he said, we are thinking that we are in heaven, but in reality, we are in hell. And that's the perfect descri description of what is happening on our island. We think, or the vast majority of people are thinking and operating as if we are um, in heaven, but in reality, we are in hell as a result of this overpopulation. So uh, even our intellectuals and our scholars, uh, they are saying um, things are going fine, things are going well. Their pockets are getting filled, but our people, our community is uh, being broken. Our lands are uh, being expropriating uh, the land from us and they are taking our lands from us. And here we cannot even build on our own territory. So that's part of it. We have the corruption, we have the, uh, the virus of uh, discrimination. And lastly, we have something that I'm calling the criminalization. Recently, we have seen, well, prior to these recent events, after the hurricane Iota and Eta, uh, we have seen the rise or the spring of leadership among uh, the religious and social leaders of the island. And within the, um, the participation and within the, the raising of their voices on behalf of the Raisa people, we have seen that they have been criminalized in, this, in the context of they have been threatened. Um, two of our leaders right now currently in the island of Old Providence have been threatened by the national government uh, so, so that they will uh, be stop from being uh, in opposition to their plans and to their uh, agenda, which is to cement their uh, military perspective and military uh, agenda on the island. So in the midst of all of this um, situation, um, I just want you to know that the rice out people, we are still resisting. The rice out people as a remnant, we are becoming more conscious and we are educating ourselves. We are being exposed. We are researching. We are making some systemic work, um, a systemic job on Wednesday. Uh, this past week, we, uh, we made some move by going out and marching and protesting and letting the local and national government know um, that we are not in agreement with the agenda and with the plan and what they are doing on the island territory. So there is a spring of leadership growing. We are making international lobbying and we are advocating to different um, international community and we have actually joined forces with our brothers and sisters on this panel in order to, to be more educated and be able to get more information as to how we can continue with this fight by um, voicing our, um, our reality and exposing our reality to the international community and educating our people in light of our reality. So my participation was just that, just to give an overview, just to give uh, a perspective as to what is happening on the island currently with this whole ordeal of um, colonialism that has given birth to overpopulation and has caused some maladies to occur among our people. So that's what I wanted to share with you, my brothers and sisters in this panel.
Thank you, Mr. At Mr. Williams Nelson. Thank you very much. Our next representative, member of the panel, is from Guyana. He is Mr. Maurice Pindert. Maurice Pindert was born in 1956 in Cayenne, Guyana. He is a retired teacher, activist member of MDES, Movement for Decolonization and Social Emancipation. He is president of ESPAL, Cultural Association, working with the elders about traditional arts and crafts. He is publication director of Rod Cozy, a political monthly newspaper of Guyane, Mr. Maurice Pindert. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, dear comrades, I will now present my country here. Just to say that we are about 90,000 square kilometers between Suriname and Brazil, in the north of South America, with, uh, with an Atlantic shoreline, thus belonging also to the greater Caribbean. As you know, we are under the rule of France, as what they decide to call an overseas territory. And you are also an ultra peripheral region of Europe. In French Guiana, they have their space center in a town named Kourou. Last month in November, the Italian rocket Vega put into orbit a military French satellite. This week, an European GPS satellite is launched by the Russian rocket Soyuz. This month, December, a giant American space telescope is supposed to be launched by the European rocket Ariane from Kourou. And secretly, it seems that Joe Biden or Kamala Harris and Emmanuel Macron might come. This information makes you understand more clearly how heavy is the foot they placed on our neck. This is the reality of our colonial situation. No comments on the land situation. The French state considers it is its private property according to a centuries old royal law, terra nullius. No comments on the edu educational program. The French state considers it is its exclusive domain or private turf. No comments on immigration matter as the French state considers no one can say nothing except the French militaries. No comments on civil security, police forces, justice, health, forest, climate situation, the other administration, all the chiefs are white French civil servants coming here for two, three years. Despite, despite the situation, since the beginning of the French colonization, our people never gave up. The indigenous people, the African people, they put into slavery. And until now, as Guyanese, Guyanan, Guyanian people, we demand our freedom, our right to self-determination, our right to be decolonized. On the political level, as we told you the past years, we support a front to change the political status of our territory in order to get autonomy. For my political party, this is not enough. We want a true decolonization. And this is the reason why we are taking part of our collective struggle. We were on the UN list after the Second War. And France government pushed us out of the list, stating that we became a French department like the other ones in France. 
okay, we have two problems. We are facing two problems. The first one, the French social security benefits, which allows our people to survive. And second one, the assimilated circle politicians here who beg to France, please don't cut the money. And they say to our people, do not want, do not vote to change the political status because France will cut the money. So we know the situation and we continue the fight. For now, with the pandemic of COVID-19, we are in another big problem. France vote a law to compel the people to take the vaccine. As we are under their rule, we are supposed to obey this law too. The employers of health organizations have to take the vaccine, otherwise they will be suspended or fired also. The official contract of the private nurses can be terminated. But when France bought that law, the rate of public vaccination was about 60% in France, but only 25% in our country. Now we are just about 35% because the people do not want to take the vaccine. So we demonstrate in the street, in the street, in order to negotiate the time to give the people more information without any penalty. But the health administrator said, the law is the law we must take the vaccine right now. So we demonstrate again. And when the prefect who represents the French power here refused to receive a delegation of the protesters, they set fire on a wood barricade near the iron gate of the prefecture. It was in July, um, 2020. Various actions and talks went on. And this year, 2021, there is two months ago, the justice called for activists who were there near the barricade, the fire. And the prosecutor said that they wanted to burn the prefecture building and the French flag. The comrade answered that they just wanted to protest and make the prefect receive us. So the prosecutor finally decided, okay, I believe you. You did not want to burn the prefecture, but you began to do it. It's the same thing. You will get between 12 and 18 months of imprisonment. The police kept the four, the, the four comrades immediately and brought them to the prison. We went on appeal and the court decided last month to give them more. The four men got 18 months prison and five month restriction of their civil rights. So we demonstrate again, and they kept all the protect protesters. Last week, the prosecutor asked for four years. The court will deliberate it the 7th of January. And we have one comrade, member of our party. He is supposed to have three years sentence and we are still demonstrating. I just want to tell you how difficult these moments are and how sensible the question of the vaccination is in the colony. Some people do not want to hear nothing, anything about it. We create like a front against the vaccine obligation and the fact that workers are getting fired from their job if they do not get vaccinated. The union called a general strike but gradually few people go and take the vaccine and some protesters become more radical and the justice too. I know it seems strange because all over the world people want to get vaccinated. Why the French colonies in the Caribbean refuse? In this week you share a video yesterday in our WhatsApp group showing Guadalupean protesters it is the same thing in Martinique and Guyane and St. Martin, French colony. I think most of the people are not against the vaccination. Some of them are afraid of the RNA vaccine, but the essential reason is the way the French government is doing with us. 
the way they speak for us on the region TV, the way they want to force us, otherwise you get fired. In the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, as we were demonstrating, claiming mask and hydro, hydro alcoholic liquid, the French civil servant of the local health administration told us, you want, you want mask, go and take your carnival mask. Go and take your carnival mask. This is an insult. At the same time, look at the critical situation of the, of the hospital. Before, before the COVID-19, the virus strikes the union called already to get a better health situation. We used to cure ourselves with traditional medicine and the French health administration do not accept that. They say we just like to drink alcohol and make voodoo. This obligation to vaccinated is interpreted as a punishment. Ladies and gentlemen, dear comrades, in our respective countries, we are all facing the cruelty of the system and the difficulties of our struggle. Next week, my party will hold his 12th Congress of 30 years of existence since our beginning in 1991. We will have a Zoom conference and I call James to be present and give our people the last news about the Dutch colonies in the Caribbean and our CPA. We believe that we will be stronger if we join our forces to meet other international authorities and let them know about our colony situation and our profound desire for emancipation. I want to congratulate all of you and especially the comrades of Bonaire. Thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. Let us continue together on that way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Maurice Pendert. Thank you very much. Mr. Maurice Pendert was the, the third uh, representative member of the, of the first panel. Uh, later on, we will have the second uh, panel. But before that, we will continue with a poem by Mrs. Davika Bisesara Shaw. Uh, I'm not going to tell, tell you um, anything about the poem. The title of the poem, that's one thing I can tell. The title of the poem is Deep Down Inside Me. This is the Vika Bizesa. Deep down inside me, I was told I am owed, I owe the colonizer. Deep down inside me, I was told by my grandmother, grandfather, my mother, my father, I have to look up to the white man. Deep down inside me, I was compelled to obey the white man. But wait, how about the white man and me? Ripped from their normal life, pushed into the unknown, ripped from their culture, ripped from their country, mother, father, sisters, brothers, even their children, ripped from it as a human and turned into the white man's property, same as an animal. My ancestors watched as mothers were raped by the white man. My ancestors watched as, my, as fathers watched raped by the white man. My ancestors were raped by the white man. My ancestors were not born slaves. My ancestors were turned into slaves by the white man. What about my bloodline being directly responsible for Holland to be one of the richest nations in the world? What about the white man who benefited billions and billions from my ancestors' sweat, blood, and tears? What about my ancestors who can say, no more can the white man say who pays 
decides. What about the white man owes me millions and millions, billions and billions? Is uh, thank you, thank you, Davika. Thank you very much. I uh, must mention that uh, this poem uh, was written also by Davika Bisasasha. So it was her own, it is her own, um, her own creation, her own thoughts that she um, gave us gave us today. Thank you. We will move on to the we'll move on to the second panel. And the second panel will also talk about initiatives and future strategies for self-determination of Caribbean and South American territories. The second panel will consist of representatives of the Virgin Islands, of Bermuda, of Curacao and Bonaire. From the Virgin Islands, us, we will have Dr. Chanzira Kahina, from Bermuda, Mr. Thomas Christopher Famous, from Curacao, Ms. Ellen Maduro Jandor, and from Bonaire, Mr. Kjell Krohn. We will start with Dr. Chanzira Kahina. Dr. Chanzira Davis Kahina. Respect, respectfully known as Dr. Chen, is a cultural riot artist. For those who does not know, a riot is an African tribal storyteller and musician. Dr. Chanzira is also educator. She is a published author. She is a motivational speaker, a media technologist, ordained high priestess. She is a visionary activist, naturopathic therapist, community developer, mother and grandmother. Dr. Davis, Kaina's academic journey include Rutgers, NCAS, Pepperdine, CA, UC San Diego, International University of Natural Sciences, and other global research, production, and teaching institutions. Dr. Davis Kaina is an elders founding director of Per Ank M. Smai Tawi, the director of the Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center and teaching faculty in the College of Liberal Arts and social sciences, both at the University of the Virgin Islands and serves on the executive committee in the Caribbean Pan-African Network, CPAN, High Commissioner General in the UNIA, founding creatrix of African Queen Mother Warriors, Cater of AAPRP, AAWRU, among other global African indigenous organizations and humanitarian liberation circles. 
Dr. Chanzira Davis Kaina. Welcome. Greetings, Hotep. Yay! Who should be? With, that's the saying that we would have with that type of an introduction. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Gracias, gracias, gracias. Merci, merci, merci. Do I want third to everyone? That's part of this sixth symposium on the political future, the right of self determination and reparations of the Caribbean and South America. I want to take a moment and still highlight how important this particular convening is because many times the voices remain voiceless or they remain ostracized like removed from the mainstream discussion and action plans of many of our respective governments so i want to make sure that persons recognize i do not represent the government of the virgin islands of the u.s i am speaking as a free independent, sovereign daughter of the Caribbean, Americas, and the world. And so a lot of what I will share will be from a perspective of what is taking place now, but also what has been so eloquently referenced uh, by my illustrious elder colleague, Dr. Corbin, because he has that chron chronological experiential background working in different elements within government here as well as outside. So I'm grateful to be able to be offering a few thoughts, a few thoughts and action of what's taking place here in the Virgin Islands of the US. I start at the beginning. When we speak of the Virgin Islands, we're speaking of a space that was considered and identified as the Danish West Indies until formally March 31st of 1917. So again, the Virgin Islands as a space, as a territory, as a existing non-incorporated, non-self-governing territory of the United States, AKA colony, has been in this space of challenge around self-determination, around independence, around authentic sovereignty and any type of autonomy in regards to the decisions that are made for the people of the Virgin Islands. The composition of the people of the Virgin Islands, and I want to make sure that I come and present that clearly, are primarily, and let's say it's still more than 75%, some say 80, but I like to go with the lower numbers, right? But it's still more than 75% people of African ancestry. And that in of itself creates another cog in the wheel that interferes with the independence, the autonomousness, the authentic sovereignty of the people that inhabit this space called the Virgin Islands. For those that are not familiar, the Virgin Islands are south of Puerto Rico, they are west of St. Kitts, Nevis, Antigua. And we are actually, when we speak of the Virgin Islands US or Virgin Islands US, as we've come to refer to it, we're speaking of St. Croix, 84 square miles, St. Thomas, 32 square miles, St. John, 20 square miles, and Water Island, two square miles. And I need for persons to just keep that in their mind space. And then the population, which has been fluctuating, there was a time where it was comfortably more than 110,000 persons. However, as was referenced by another one of my illustrious colleagues, Dr. Rhoda Arundel, the two category five hurricanes, Irma and Maria, that impacted this region and other parts significantly in the Caribbean in 2017, transformed everything. It transformed the types of industries that were prioritized here. It transformed what was happening in our educational arena. It transformed what was happening in all aspects of the economy. And the population dropped significantly. While the population dropped significantly with a number of our indigenous ancestral African 
native Virgin Islanders leaving to go to safer spaces, be able to get their children, you know, restored into educational environments, etc. There was an influx of non-Virgin Islanders that within 90 days, I want to highlight that, could become residents of the Virgin Islands with the same privileges and authority and powers of other Virgin Islanders because we are still without a constitution, because we are still following a revised Organic Act of 1954 approved primarily by the US government with very little involvement, engagement of the native indigenous ancestral people populating, inhabiting these Virgin Islands. So I need for persons to have that in their perspective. Many times when we start to speak like that, people say that we're not showing our, what's the term I was told? Gratitude or our appreciation of all that the United States government has afforded the people of the Virgin Islands. And so I don't want it to get misunderstood that this is the voice of everybody in the VI. This is the voice that's coming to you from your comrade, Sister Dr. Chinzira. And I'm giving it to you from the place of what really exists beyond people romanticizing on the benefits of being a territory in 2021 going into 2022 of the United States government at a time that the United States government has exhibited its own inability to even address its own American issues and problems. So this is happening on a variety of levels. So I wanna highlight three points. There's been a resurgence of funding from the Department of the Interior of the US government to revisit the 1954 Revised Organic Act and to have considerations, research, reaching out to the people, particularly the electorate, those that are registered voters, those that desire to really be participatory in the changes, the transformations of the government of the Virgin Islands. And there has been a thrust to adopt the 1954 Revised Organic Act. Notice what I keep saying, 1954. I'm not sure how effective a document that had a lot of racist, sexist, classist elements would be from 1954 to 2022. Let's just say hypothetically, this is what's done next year. So there's been a lot of question around that process. And there's been a significant neglect of doing the proper type of public education to ensure that the voices that are involved in making this decision are actually Virgin Islanders and not persons that have just come after natural disasters take over the space. That it's not only persons that come with a very American, and I wanna be very specific, a very American, a very Europeanized American perspective to then impose that onto a space that is predominantly populated by people of African ancestry that are still uncovering the layers of trauma that have been in, in place from before 1917, from the transfer and the purchase, without any input from the inhabitants that were here in 1917. I want persons to keep that in, in, in mind. The second point that I'd like to highlight for the purposes of our discourse today is how important it is for us to have these types of convenings and for us to be able to share the similarities as well as some of the uniqueness, because there are differences, but some of the similarities in terms of how colonization in the 21st century has its talons to dismantle our ability to have control and autonomy for our body, mind, soul, spirit, and consciousness. Person spirituality are being questioned as we speak, just because we are demanding, decreeing, I'll use the Vatican's term, we, it's a decree for human beings to desire human rights and freedom. It is not a request, it's a decree, like a popo bull, right? We wanna call it like how it goes. And while 
in other circumstances, other nations have been able to make these decrees, make determinations, create their own constitution without the permissions or oversight of another entity. That's not the case in the Virgin Islands. There has been conversations, my third point, around citizenship. And like we have expressed for a sense, in other parts of the world, when, for example, I'll just use my, my recent favorite that everyone knows sometimes, you know, I'm always talking about and bragging about Barbados. The fact that Barbados hit, was able to have that insight, have the support, and of course there was some dissenting views to become a republic in 2021 and to use their 55th anniversary of their independence as the time to make that actual transfer on the best interests of the people of Barbados. All of us should be looking at this very seriously. All of us in this Caribbean, South American, Central American space. Because it gives us an opportunity to know that some things are possible even when the institutions that exist are very racist, very sexist, and very classist in terms of dismantling our very core of our humanity as free thinking people of African and indigenous ancestry. I think it's also fitting for us to look at what some of the issues are around citizenship, some of the diplomatic status or lack thereof that is afforded to many of us speaking this truth to power, talking about our sovereignty and speaking of our sovereignty in a way that we can reclaim our indigenous languages, we can reclaim our indigenous lands, we can reclaim our indigenous economic drivers, and we should be at the forefront of how that is brought forward. So I'm saying this because here in the Virgin Islands, a lot of that is lacking. And because it's, a, you know, now that we're moving into different seasonal observances, persons will overlook a lot of this until the next election. People will overlook what's going on here until another crisis or another pandemic, whatever name they give it, Omicron, COVID-19, COVID Delta, RGP29, whatever they call it, there's always been this interference in our human right, our autonomy, our self-determination, our independence, and our freeness. And I'm not saying freedom, I'm speaking of our freeness, our ability to choose, our ability to have free will and to exercise that free will in a way that will be beneficial for our individual selves, our families, our village communities, our societies, our nations, et cetera. So I'm really grateful when we start to have these types of discussions and I'm hoping that questions come forward regarding, you know, where, how do we do more of this together? How do we build legacy from today, December 5th, 2021 to move this discussion forward with action, actionable items? How do we make sure that these international bodies, the United Nations, Africa, African Union, European Union, CARICOM, any of these international entities, how do we ensure that they hear us and that there are actionable deliverables that are put in place to ensure that we are afforded the human rights that are deserving to us? The inalienable ones, and the unalienable ones, the ones that are like God-given to people, how people like that term God-given. People like to talk about God-given until we ask for it. And then it'd be like, Whoa. everybody gets quiet. But at the end of the day, our focus, when we speak of self-determination, reparatory justice, reparations, restitution, repatriation, all these re, 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 we're talking about a renewal of how we show respect to one another, how we start to finance and fund our own programs. Those entities that have the resources that they have pretty much so exploited from our common persons and our respective colonies. I don't like to use that term often, but that's what it is. 
no, there's not supposed to be any colonies, even according to UN charters and resolutions since the 1960s. And we're still having like a fourth decade of the eradication of colonialism. We're, we're in the international decade for people of African descent, seventh, eighth year, persons didn't even know that the decade existed regarding recognition, justice and development for people of African descent. We have Afro descendants kind of activities going on. People don't know that it's going on. So I'm asking at the same time, I'm encouraging that what is happening here in the VI, while people may think that, oh, well, you're under America, you have a lot of flexibility, you have a lot of money, that's not the case. The money is allocated for the same colonial institutions that promote that the Virgin Islands is still a non-incorporated, non-self-governing territory of the United States of America, December, 2021, when the rest of the world is busy becoming republics and independent and free. So I say that, and I say it with a tad of humor because this could make people very tra traumatized and not want to be engaged in the process. And that's not what we're attempting to get across. We're just attempting to get across that for those that are listening, viewing, engaging, there is a site of people's historical journey to self-determination. It is compiled by multi-generational Virgin Islanders, persons that have ties to here from before 1917, right? And they have created a series of resources that help not only in the Virgin Islands, but any entity, any space that is moving in the direction of human rights, self-determination and reparatory justice. And I would encourage all of us to look at that particular site. I'll make sure to put it into the chat so that this way we can move things forward. I believe I have exhausted my 12. I had to feel like well, I could like for money the world, yeah. I can't speak to my real issue if I did it. I don't want to get hear, on. I'm mm -hmm. hearing two things. I mean, any sort of thing that comes up, I don't know. Um, whereas for us. Correct. Okay, there we go. Have I exhausted my 12 minutes? No, you haven't. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, just a Great. I just wanted to, my, my closing piece, and thank you for that, is just to make sure that at the same time that we're having these types of discussions, that everything that we're doing, and we know that everyone that's here that has been part of this alliance has always shown our, our love, our respect for what is being done by, we want Bonaire back in Bonaire, because your fight is our fight your your passion we share your passion the thrust that you have given in terms of the guidance you've gained from different scholars you know inclusive of dr corbin inclusive of other representatives in aruba bonaire curacao saint eustatius french Guyane, san andreas isla providencia you know, all of these different spaces that we're referencing here, the Virgin Islands, Bermuda, I'm sure that it's gonna to continue to expand. A lot of what we're speaking about allows for us to move this trajectory so that it's not just what we say, but what we're actually doing to create transformative change and that it's not going to be very slow. Some persons believe that this is gonna be like, we've gotta wait another century to see transformative growth. So I've expressed to a number of persons here in the Virgin Islands and along with my colleagues that are part of various Pan-African networks and especially through the efforts of the African Queen Mother Warriors because these are unapologetic women that when we say African women lead, we say it without apology and we say it with direct passion. I'm gonna put it like that. And it's in a form that we have had to because we're forced to make sure that we are in alliance with other sisters and brothers around the region, around the world that are about our liberation, our authentic unification, 
and the introduction of social governance that allows for us to be authentically sovereign, authentically secure, and authentically free. Very different than just the jargon and how many times we get to go to a conference and a Congress and a meeting and a seminar. Our focus is so that every discussion we have, every meeting that we convene, every function that we participate in is building towards our authentic liberation, unification, social governance, and sovereign power, right? And that's what is making at least my contribution for today, something that I'm very, very appreciative. I am always grateful for the opportunity to be able to share. And I'm always looking for ways that we can begin to develop that alliance in a way that we don't only see ourselves like as people that are from St. Martin, Bonaire, and Cayenne. You see what I'm saying? That we see ourselves as one because we're, we're talking about one family, one combination of persons that are always pushing our liberation, our unification, our social governance, and our authentic sovereignty with power. And I say it with security because when you start to say these things, people will come after you. That's why we have people protesting all over the region for a variety of reasons. People are protesting for proper education. People are protesting for clean water. People are protesting for proper housing. People are protesting for authentic security. People are protesting so that we can stop all this gun violence in not just the Caribbean, in the planet. People are protesting because of climate change. People are protesting because of public health violations. I'll come to that perhaps in the Q and A, because not everybody is feeling these mandatory vaccines for diseases that change regularly, okay? If you're gonna say it's COVID, then be consistent, but don't call it COVID this and then COVID that and then Omicron this and then create other names and keep fear at the core of dismantling our humanity, right? So I say that because we need to also talk about how we're gonna heal ourselves heal our communities or else all this conversation on self-determination, reparatory justice, reparations, restitution, repatriation won't have any meaning because there won't be anybody alive here to have this conversation with. So I'm gonna end there and just encourage more discourse. Again, I'm always honored to be able to share a thought in action of what is taking place here in the Virgin Islands and just remember, as I started, I am a daughter of the entire Caribbean Americas and the globe. And I'm unapologetically an African queen mother warrior. So with that, I really am grateful to be able to share. And I'm hoping that in our Q&A, we can cover up anything that I may have made reference to that persons may need clarification on. Thank you so much. I return the virtual lectern over to you, Brother Sidney. Thank you, Sanzira. Thank you, Dr. Sanzira Davis Kaina. Thank you very much. May I remind everybody that we have later on a QA section in which you can um, ask your questions and um, seek clarification, etc. So just um, write your uh, question, uh, note it so that you don't uh, forget it. And later on, we'll have, we will have uh, the opportunity uh, during the Q&A. Our next speaker, representative member of the panel is Mr. Thomas Christopher Famous. Mr. Thomas Christopher Famous. Mr. Thomas Christopher Famous is a graduate of the Barclay Institute and a member of the Barclay Education Society Management Community, which oversees all aspects 
of the Barker Institute. His passion is promoting the history of the Barker Institute and raising this awareness across all media. He is a long serving 25 year employee of Bermuda Electric Light Company, where he works in the generation department, which is responsible for 12 diesel generators and six gas turb turbines, which power up 24 hours per day. He is a business owner who fully understands the need to balance workers' rights, business plans, and the contribution workers and business make to a growing and healthy economy. He is an award-winning columnist, having written hundreds of columns for the Bermuda Sun, Bear News, Caribbean News Now, Today in Bermuda and the Royal Gazette. As a 1989 graduate of the Bermuda College Technical Program, one of the specials is to in increase the number of Bermudians in the technical fields such, such as automotive science, the construction industry, HVAC, and telecommunications. Installed with the values of equality for all workers' rights and forward thinking pol policies, Chris, as he named himself, was grooming to be involved in grassroots party activities, community action, and spirit. He has served as the party organizer for the Progressive Labor, Labor Party and is a member of the party's campaign and public relations committees. He is in the Royal Bermuda Regiment for five years and achieved a rank of acting sergeant responsible for a platoon of 20 soldiers. Now as MP for Devon Flyer. <laughs> His main passion and responsibility is to ensure all residents of Devonshire have their concern addressed. One of his goals as a parliamentarian is to strengthen cooperation and assistance among Caribbean governments. Mr. Thomas Christopher Famous. Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes. Uh, my apologies. I'm, I'm actually traveling. I'm, I'm in the UK right now. So that's why I'm outside. I'm not in a closed studio. Um, thank you all for giving me this opportunity and uh, having me come back again this year. Um, I see my sister, Davika, and I see my mentor, Dr. Corbin. And, and Brother Jane Finesse as well. Can you hear me? Affirmative, yes. Yes, okay. Um, so I, I will give a very brief presentation for that and step outside a minute. Um, I was asked to speak on the self-determination of colonists in the Caribbean and South America, Central America and South America. So I'll start with a very small, analogy. Every tree starts from a seed. Every house starts from a foundation. And every revolution starts from a conversation. So I, I outlined three small steps. The first step is we have to accept the fullness of our unequal relationship of our colonizers. In any abusive relationship, the abuser tricks the abuse into, ration, into having some rationale why they are continuously abused. We have people throughout the overseas territories and Caribbean on a hill who still rationalize with our abusers. We have people in Barbados who still were upset that the queen was removed as the other state. 
So one of our first, our first priorities amongst ourselves is to understand that rather than the French, the Dutch, the English, the Americans, the Spanish, the Colombians, they do not see us as equals. We should never ever lull ourselves into thinking that maybe, maybe, maybe if we act nice, they will treat us good next time. They are not. Trust me, they are not. I've been up in England for a month dealing with meetings with the uh, UK government, and they don't see us as equals, and they have no intentions of treating us as equals. They are not our friends, and they are truly not trying to help us develop for self-determination. I was fortunate this year to travel to St. Martin, St. Eustatius, Dominica. Um, and in St. Martin and St. Eustatius, the Dutch are just basically blatant with the colonialism, just blatant. So an uh, example, in St. Eustatius, they want a ferry service for to give people an option for cheaper, cheaper transportation between islands. The Dutch says, oh, well, we can't do that right now because we don't have enough staff. Like, how are you helping us lower our cost of living? They, as, as was stated earlier in Bonnier, they are raising the taxes on people. That's gentrification. Uh, step two, we have to educate ourselves and each other about the realities of the way forward. I heard uh, the sister from St. Martin and the other sister from Empress from uh, USVI speak about um, being accepted by international bodies. The international regional bodies are, is, a, is a process, right? You can't just say as, as, um, as a grouping like us, oh, accept us as a regional body. You have to, you have to be either associate member or full member. To get recognized in the United States, United Nations, sorry, um, you have to have be listed. The Dutch aren't, the Dutch colonists are not listed. So there's a process to everything, but we have to educate ourselves to do that. We must not, we must stop waiting to find ourselves in situations where our backs up against the wall and they don't try to educate our people about looking at other arrangements. By that time, we're already in a reactionary mood versus a proactive mood. And we're fighting a losing battle because once the colonial power has already decided they're going to take this path, well, it's already too late. They already figured out what they want, what, they, what, what the end result that they want. So I'll give you some examples. Are you hearing me, Gordon? Yes, Hello? we can hear you. Go ahead. We can hear you. Go okay. ahead. So, so some prime examples. What's happening in Bonnier and Central Stations right now? It's prime examples. My my brother that I grew up with, uh, Comrade Clive Van Putten, was fighting an uphill bat battle in Station because the Dutch already have a predetermined result that they want. But he I'm trying to educate his people, our people about those realities. Too many of them have already been full prey and co-opted that. Another example is a commission of inquiry in the DVI that one governor, one little white guy from England decides he's gonna paint the whole government and people of DVI as corrupt. Now the entire government has to focus millions of dollars into trying to fight accusations. The lack of assistance after Hurricane Irma and Maria in Anguilla. The attempts to gentrify our voter bases in the overseas territories. Dr. Corbin spoke of this earlier. What the English are trying to do is give uh, the right of British workers in the overseas territories the right to vote in our elections, which as Dr. Corbin has educated me, is the same thing the French have done in Polynesia, in French Polynesia. Uh, a few years ago, um, they came out as a, quote unquote, a, a, a report from a select committee. 
No, we're hearing it straight from the ministers that that's what they want to do. Well, what, what? When we ask them the question, they're not denying it. Let's put it that way. Um, a few years ago, the British ran into Turks and Caicos Island and just suspended the, com the, the Constitution. So there's examples of they already have the predetermined result when they do something. So we have to, and we 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 always act in, in reaction to this. We have to work proactively, right? As we know, our Caribbean people are, in my words, very unique. We have to sow the seeds of decolonization far in advance and continuously. We cannot, we may, what we do today may not see decolonization of any of our countries in the next five to 10 years. But we have to sow the seeds for our next generation. The third point is most important, what we're doing here now. We have to unite. I didn't know the history of what's going on in San Andreas and Provin Provinci Dallas. Sorry if I pronounce it correct. I didn't know that history. I was educated. Now I'm saying I have to unite with my brothers and sisters down there. To grassroots organizations such as this, we must continue to learn about each other's struggles. We must be willing to give each other regional and global exposure through social media. The colonizers, BBC, CNN, uh, Dutch TV, they're not gonna give us profile, any high profile of what's going on, what they're doing to us. We have to do that to ourselves. And we have to do that for each other. We have to feature each other on each other's media. And the, the unfortunate reality is many of our elected officials are afraid to speak up as uh, the lady from St. Martin says, you're not, you're not gonna get any of those elected officials speaking up about independence at, at present. I, I met with some earlier this year. I asked, where, where do they stand in, in telling people they need to go independent? Well, you know, we have to take this in small steps. You know what that means. So it's up to us to unite, to support each other in tough times, just as what Brother James Finesse went through, what the BVI is going through, what St. Martin is going through, what Stacia is going through, support each other more. And even if it means just once a week or once a month, send somebody a WhatsApp, hey, how are you doing? So I will, I will end the way I started. Every tree starts with a seed, every house starts from a foundation, and every revolution starts from a conversation. And I thank you for allowing me to be part of this conversation. Much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Thomas Christopher Finnis. Thank you very much. Although you are on the move, you could um, stand your part. Thank you very much. The next speaker, the next representative of the panel is Mr. Charles Woodley. He is from Central Stations. Mr. Charles Woodley was born on the island of St. Eustatius. He was removed from office by the Dutch government claiming mismanagement of government finances, derelictions of duties, intimidation, and much more. He is the president of the All for One Labor Union and a political activist, Mr. Charles Woodley. Good evening, folks. Um, nice to hear that everybody's still going on. Um, I'm sorry for the noise. I'm working, actually. I was just listening in and uh, was 
I am not okay. Yes. Yes. Good afternoon. Or good evening. Good evening. Um. Yeah. I uh, was listening in, actually still busy at work. I have some deadlines. Um, what can I say? When I listen to uh, Maurice, I listen to Sister Shenzira and, and Chris and all the others, is that, yeah, our difference is all the same because our experiences are all the same. Um, yeah, based on our removal from office while trying to, you know, make Stacia sustainable you realize that over um, since the Dutch has uh, came to the island, uh, gotten here and took over the island, um, their main agenda is to make sure that all um, government on assets that belong to the people of Stacia are put into the hands of Dutch companies and um, Dutch civil servants. So like um, Maurice mentioned, what happening with the, the, the French um, civil servants, we have similar, I believe Bonaire is similar. All the other islands I listened to Sister Shenziva, we realized that this migration process is also something that is happening um, throughout the um, the Caribbean, the world, and um, here is no exception to the rule. When we look at many plans and projects that we had in place to create and stimulate our economic, um, to strengthen our economy, we realize that none of these things are being looked at. They're not even being realized. We realize that um, we continue to run on a deficit and every um, opportunity the Dutch government will prop up with the extra million dollars here incidentally and an extra million dollar there and we realize that they are creating a dependency in which whenever if ever they decide to return government to um the the, the people where we have democracy um you would be um into a system that you will never be able to repay the debts and all the loans and grants that they are putting in place via the Dutch government. One example is that, um, you know, Van Putten is still standing strong on cases like the, the housing foundation, the social housing, that is something that the Dutch believes that in order for them to subsidize house rent on the island, um, our local housing foundation must turn over all assets to a company that the Dutch um, sent here. Um, it was formerly Wonlini and now it's Basal. And um, in this company, um, the Dutch is willing to invest some 15 million um, euros. Now, if not, if this company um, is not accepted by the island council, uh, which is not, the people are not for it because we had other plans where people would own these homes like on Bonaire and Kurt St. Martin and um, most of the other islands where these homes become property of the people that have resided or lived in these homes for so many years. Um, the Dutch government is willing to turn or, or give all these assets over to only me now known as Basal. Um, there's a fight going on and it's it's stuck because we know in Bonaire, this wasn't the case in, 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 in Sabre. This wasn't the case where you just turn your assets over to a Dutch company without asking any questions. Um, we talked about the Corona measures. Um, we have not had one single case of Corona here um, amongst our people really. And now they're coming with measures asking teachers to be tested weekly. And these are things that you realize that um, it is, I see it as a, a world order, a world agenda, and the fight is becoming even more uphill. Our people here are saying, or some even that I once, you know, um, 
worked hand in hand with uh, saying, yes, give the Dutch a chance, give the Dutch a chance. But we realize that they are constantly taking away and moving away um, rights of the indigenous people. Um, you know, um, fishermen um, can no longer fish as they used to. Their boats were removed from the seashores and put somewhere further. Um, farmers, um, goats are being, um, and, and, and the wildlife is being shot in the hills while those downtown are allowed to roam because they say they are causing erosion. We all know that uh, we see our livestock as, as our resources. We eat them. We, 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 we also sell meat, local meat, fresh organic meat. And um, we see that our island is changing right before our eyes and there's not much people or energy to stand up anymore and fight. I have um, been on the scene for some time. However, I right now I'm currently busy with a, a radio program every Thursday from eight to nine. And for the rest von Putin, he is trying, but it is difficult because seeing all the measures and seeing the heavy handedness, people are becoming um, subservient, people are becoming, um, you know, more like, hey, we can't fight, we can't beat it, we can't win the system, so they're just um, accepting um, as things come along. Um, we hope that this would not be um, the way things would go, but in reality right now, and it, I'm not talking about defeat, I am simply stating that right now, um, when uh, when we went into the elections in 2020, 2020 I thought that um, we had a team that would really stand and champion um, the autonomy case. As of now, I can say that this is not the case, at least for one or two of our council members. I believe that they are very weak when it comes to pushing that agenda. The lone voice that has always been there, Von Putin, he continues to push and fight. However, um, you know, it is it takes more than one, it takes more than two, you know, to get things rolling. I know that James and Vicky and, and the others and all of you continue, but in Stacia we have a situation where um, we are totally um, defenseless uh, against uh, this system as we speak. Um, I, we can make noise, we can do certain things, we can write letters, but at the end of the day, um, our people uh, have endured so, man, so much um, abuse, be it mentally, um, be it um, in, in, in losing their uh, patrimonies, that they are a bit tired and I believe at the end of the road, if we are not dead, we will definitely be all um, back into slavery again. This is a reality. This is my reality. I speak of it and maybe people or some persons may disagree because you will come to station, you would see a lot of pretty colors all over the roads. I will see certain things. There's a lot of money being invested in window dressing and camouflage so that you think everything is well, but we are facing very difficult times here on Sintustatius in the way things are done. There's a new normal where um, the land is being sold, the cadastre law, which we fought against. Um, we now have cadastre, um, cadastre in the Netherlands, which we fought against. We thought that we should have our own cadastre with a joint, um, working relationship with Bonaire um, as a local government back then. Those were one of the decisions that we took, seeing that um, we have a lot of undivided property here and these families, we would like to give these families the opportunity to have their land sorted and not being taken away by the Dutch government or anyone else. However, um, reality has it that um, a local has been appointed to that position. I spoke to the local and I let him know that I believe that 
um, not because he is a local and been put in the position that the agenda has changed because the laws remain the same. And you would realize that some of our locals are willing to accept these positions and saying, well, at least it's a local in the position. However, the agenda is not ours. It is a um, colonialistic agenda to steal our land and put it into the hands of Dutch, um, Dutch elites. And um, yeah, this is how um, I view things here. And like I say, um, although we won the election, um, our uh, a great part of our um, council members seem not to um, realize the urgency or discard what is actually going on here. I do not have a seat so I can speak based as, as a citizen of, of St. Justatius. I speak here as a voter, I speak here as a son of the soil. And this is my take as to um, the current situation here on the island. Thank you for allowing me this space. I have to get back to work as I, um, I will continue to listen and um, I will definitely list, try to listen to the Q and A's, um, okay. James, and to all the others, Sister Shenzira, Chris, and uh, Maurice, all the others who are there, um, Lopez and Dr. Corbin, all the others, um, Rizal people. I want to wish you much success in all your endeavors, and I hope that you will remain connected as one team, one voice, and as Dr. Corbin always say, stay strong. Thank you all, and until another opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woodley. Thank you, Mr. Charles Woodley. Our next panel member is from Curacao, Mrs. Ellen Maduro. Maduro Jandor. Mrs. Ellen Maduro Jandor is a sociologist, anthropologist, past public officer employee at the Central Bureau of Statistics, political militant, and incoming president of Movimento Causa Prome. From Mrs. Ellen Maduro Chandor, welcome. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, or I think I have to say good evening already. The sun is going down. It's already evening over here. So good evening. As a member of the Caribbean Progressive Alliance, a cooperation agreement between non-government and political organizations that was made in 2018 during a conference in Kralendijk Bonaire. It's with great pleasure that we, of Causa Prome, are participating in this virtual conference. A sisterly and a brotherly greeting from Causa Prome to all participants and all observers. Movimento Causa Prome reaffirms its position as a political organization that stands for unconditional freedom for people of all countries, all nations, to choose to be independent and to serve in the first place its citizens and in no way alien corporations and world powers that are owners of capital. As a political emancipatory organization, Causa Prome supports and cooperates with all political struggles for decolonization. Decolonization is very, very important for the emancipation of the people. When can we speak of decolonization of the mind of our people? When the people begin to work on their own development, their own well-being. 
when people reject the false consciousness and memory imposed on him during centuries. When the people stop defending, imitating, and repeating everything the oppressor, the colonizer, is preaching. When the people reject visions, views, perspectives imposed on them and start creating their own visions, their own missions and goals. When people reach such a level of awareness that they will come together and unite. Colonization is all about dominating the countries and its people to benefit the economic, the financial, geopolitical, political interests of the colonizer. The colonizing power will never take the general well-being of its citizens into account. Causa Promé supports all struggles of people everywhere to achieve respect for their right to their self-determination. All struggles for demanding respect for the Charter of the UN, especially the articles in Chapter 11 concerning the territories without measure of self-government. An important part of the struggle is the right to culture and respect for the own culture. Article 73 of the chapter of the United Nations states that the colonizer has to respect the culture of the people and guarantee the well being of the people in the first place. With regard to culture, the Netherlands has no right to introduce Dutch norms and values in the six colonies. Clearly, Dutch actions such as euthanasia, abortion, same sex marriage, use of drugs, and tolerating pedophilia. For Causa Promé, a very essential condition in the process of empowerment is the compulsory process of emancipatory education, emancipatory formation of the people, the people that we as organization are fighting for. It's obvious that we as popular progressive and anti-colonial movements cannot solve the problem of colonial domination and exploitation without empowering the people because it's the people themselves who can solve their real problems in a forceful way. A political struggle for emancipation should be a struggle with the people, the people with consciousness, united and well informed. In the process of empowerment of the people, we have to provide some guarantees to fortify the self identity, to create patriotism, to practice constant emancipatory formation, to democratize education, to create the opportunity for permanent education for adults and opportunity for second chance education, to broaden the general knowledge on, of our own history, to broaden the general knowledge of our own culture, to give eliminative opportunity for people to get social, liberal, spiritual, economical, cultural, and political strength. We cannot empower people and transform them into a collective unity without decolonizing their minds. Patriotism 
self-pride and the presence of dignity as a community are undeniable values that we need that need to be there to make the struggle a legitimate one. Political rulers were for the were for the Dutch domination and colonialism will continue helping Holland outrage, despise, and humiliate their own people. I want to finish this discourse with two statements. One, the political future and the right to self-determination and the reparation of the people of the Caribbean and Latin America depends in the first place on the awareness of the people. That's the reason that people must be educated in order to reach this unity to get our well being. The second statement the second statement is Causa Promé is in favor of progressive organizations that are striving for real emancipation for the islands of the past Antilles to create a unity of action, a unity against the Dutch colonialism to achieve self-government as free people. Thank you again for allowing Causa Promé to speak this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Ellen Maduro Jandor. Thank you very much. We will move to our last, but surely not least, member of the second panel. Um, I need to remind everybody that we passed six o'clock and I ask you to stay with us a little while uh, because after the, the last speaker of the second panel, we will have a short Q&A uh, before closing today. So please um, stay with us some more minutes. It is now 6.22. We planned to end the program at six o'clock, but it, uh, um, it didn't happen. But please uh, stay with us. Our next speaker is from Bonaire. He is Mr. Kjeld Kroon. Mr. Kjeld Kroon is a Bonarian student at the University of Leiden. He has a mother from Bonaire and a father from Curaçao. He is studying global and comparative philosophy, majoring in political philosophy, decolonial philosophy and African philosophy. He is co-founder of ACC Leiden a student union for African and Caribbean students in the and around Leiden. Kjeld is currently an intern at the Bonaire Human Rights Organization. Mr. Kjeld. Hello, everybody can hear me clearly. Um, first of all, thank you yes. for allowing me to uh, speak at this, at this wonderful conference with beautiful, uh, intelligent mm -hmm. fighting for a good cause. Um, as I am last, I, I, I've, I've heard a lot of the, the points that I was going to address myself um, when it comes about the initiative and future strategies mentioned already by Dr. Shanzira, by Mr. Thomas, by uh, Mrs. Ellen. So I'll 
keep that short and I'll skip a bit over those parts. Um, what I'm here to, to talk about specifically is what I personally have observed during my, during my time on Bonaire and also as someone who is living in the colonial country, um, kind of what, what I think that can be done for the situation. And um, as Mrs. Allen just uh, mentioned, the, the, the one primary thing we need is education. Um, and it's education on, on different parts. One part of it is education about democracy. And that's something that needs to be done here on Bonaire for people. Um, one of the reasons that we, 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 we are in a situation we are in and to begin with is because of um, how, how we've, we never had a proper democratic process. Um, what we have here is something that James, James himself terms as a political patronage, right? It's where a party can pretty much buy votes. People don't directly vote for um, the policy of a person, but rather for the person's name or for the person's affiliation instead of, um, you know, addressing that, uh, that, that part. So, uh, I think that's one thing that definitely is necessary here to, to change the, the, the way people think about politics, about democracy, about voting. The second part of what we need to educate is the global community. And that is where initiatives like this, conferences like this, uh, there, there is an expression of that, of course. Um, the global community has, just is not aware of the colonialism that is present in the Caribbean, as many of you as have mentioned before. It's something that indeed, even if you look at some of the academic uh, uh, um, articles and stuff that come out on the topic, if you look at the whole, uh, the whole notion of post-colonialism as it's being called in, in, in academic circles, it's, it's based on this fallacy that colonialism is a thing of the past. And that's something that needs to be uh, really, really, addressed and corrected because yeah it, 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 it does more damage than than any good um, uh, and next to that of course because of the situation we're in with uh, colonizers being be, be it france be it the us be it the netherlands be it uh, the uk um we, we already from our experience and from our history we are aware of the fact that individually our islands cannot stand up against the power of the big professors. And yes, so we need to come together and also work together with, of course, um, other institutions and countries all over the world to have a firm stance against the behavior of these colonizing countries. Uh, the third part of education, and this ties more into something, you know, I, I think I, I can do myself because I still need to return to the Netherlands, sadly, to finish my studies there. Um, but it's it's education of the Dutch constituents. Um, as mentioned before, also um, the people there are not aware at all of what is happening here. And it, 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 you say that the dialogue around it is always like, oh, it's the beautiful Paradise Islands. Oh, everything is so great. I think uh, Mr. Charles Woodley addressed this. You have a lot of um, masking of reality by making one or two beautiful buildings or, uh, or, or investing so much in facilities that only accommodate the Dutch settlers here or only accommodate tourists that the struggle of the Bonarian people themselves is, 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 is overlooked um, because it, 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 isn't addressed, um, it, it isn't addressed properly. Um, if you look, for example, at history books, um, I know, I know in the UK, there is a bit more of a movement towards um, addressing the history of slavery in their textbooks, and contextualizing that. Well, the Dutch government is heavily opposed against it. They do not want our history in the Dutch history books. Even for us here, it is a problem to teach about our own history. So that is something that definitely needs to change. Um, next to that, why also, at least for now, I think there is a point in constituents too, because of the democratic setup that we are in. Um, we so-called have representation in the Dutch government, but we do not. 
not have enough people on the island to even gain one seat in the Dutch government for our voice to be heard there. So it, it, it's a thing where, at least when it comes about talking publicly and, and creating a public dialogue also there so that so that it can be, it can be more, more, I don't know, uh, progress, more of a dialogue, um, these things need to be addressed. So it's uh, education about specifically all those things. Um, one thing also that is very important to educate about is of course uh, the current system that we're in with the Netherlands. Um, one thing that I always hear when I say anything is I'm someone I, I choose to very specifically pick the word colony whenever I describe the island, whatever denomination they give us, it is incorrect um, by, by every, every handling with us, all, all the tactics they use, their colonial tactics. So that's why I prefer to use the word colony. Yet often people say, but you guys chose for this. You guys chose to be in a situation uh, with the Netherlands. You chose for a direct tie. And one thing that we clearly need to educate people about is that this is not true. We never picked this. The people of Bonaire never chose to be in the current constitutional situation that we are in with the Netherlands. Uh, we've been lied to, we've been deceived by the Dutch government and uh, corrupt politicians on our side too conceived about the promises, about the, the progress, the, the developments we would get by having a direct tie with the Netherlands. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have this system of political patronage where the, the parties pretty much just buy votes. And with that whole system in place, it made it easy for them to lie and, and, and falsely convince our people that this is the right way to go. And that put us in a situation that we're in now. When people had to pick for the current situation, for the current constitutional linkage, at least it wasn't known that it would be a constitutional linkage in that day. When people were told to vote in 2004, people voted for direct ties, believing in more financial security and things like that. However, that term direct ties, although it was what people voted for, nowhere was there any regulation and plans it wasn't, it, will, it wasn't put in place yet what those direct ties would mean. It is after the fact, after that people have selected this, of course, with the, the, the deception by the politicians, after this was done, then the Dutch government had full power, full freedom to fill in whatever they wanted to fill in under the definition of direct ties. And that has put us in the place where we are today, where there is open collaboration for migration. Sorry, sorry I'm missing, mixing my words there. Open policy for immigration uh, for the Dutch people, European Dutch people who come here. Um, we are being outnumbered and every day there's two planes that are landing and bringing more Dutch people onto our island that are uh, making us, the Bonarian people, a minority on our own island. And this is something very dangerous. I'm gonna bring that back to democracy because so far, people from Bonaire have been able, although being deceived, we, we had the ability to exact our democratic will. Um, as things are going right now, at the rate they are going, we are being we are, we are being made a minority. And once that happens, that means that we cannot even accept our democratic will because Dutch people will outnumber us on the island and therefore their, their will is what will be exacted. Um, so, and what we, be said as this is the will of people in air. That's something that we have to fight um, urgently. We don't have a lot of time left before this changes and we cannot even represent ourselves on our islands through um, democratic means. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I'm gonna keep it short since we're already a bit late on time too. Uh, that's, that is what I want to address. Strategies I think that we can use um, to, to further deliver the plan. And, um, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kjell Crow. Thank you. I will, we will move now to the Q and A's and I will, um, I will pass you to the warm hands of Dr. Chenzira Davis-Kaina, who 
who will uh, be the the person directing the Q and A's, Ms. Dr. Chenzira. Greetings, uh, everyone again. I Good. give you the mic. Thank you. I'm there in Bonaire. Just know, I hope you can feel my presence. I'm there in Bonaire. I'm feeling the breeze. I'm feeling the love. Q and A, no one seemed to put any questions inside of our chat. However, I would like to open up first to just commend everyone for being able to provide some very clear, cogent points. Ah, okay, I see someone's hands raised. Let me stand corrected. But some cogent points around self-determination, re, you know, reparation, the desire for independence, and the clarity that persons have all shared regarding the impact of colonialism. I'm really grateful when we give the definitions clear. Sister Corinne, Corinne are you, did you have a question that you were gonna raise? Well, Morsonella, I have to leave, but I wanted to say before I leave that it's a privilege for me to be here this evening with you guys. Um, uh, it's have been easy for none of us during uh, these this two years that we haven't seen each other, but we have been in contact, thank God. And I want to uh, give a thanks to the Lord for Dr. James, Davika, uh, Tulsi, Dr. Chensira, Lodesca, Dr. Corbin, all of you that have made possible this renewal get together once more and this six symposium once more keeping us together. And, and that is so important for us. You know that um, unity is strength. And uh, when we can able to get together, we will be strengthening each other so that we can continue this process that we start uh, to self-determination. So um, I wanted to give you guys thanks for that. And then I will want to say something to Dr. Chancira before I leave. How can we make action together as one Caribbean people in front of the International Organization of Human Rights. I think we have to start take action together, having some activity uh, as one, as one people, one voice, one territory. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Let's make that happen. I, I'm okay, so I, I have to say goodbye, but um, I send my love for each and every one of you. God bless you all. Thank Lessons. you. Bye bye. Uh -huh. So much. Thank bye. you. So much. Was there anyone else that had a question that they'd like to pose or a comment that they'd like to close with? Yes. Uh, Harry McNish from San Andres. Yes, please. Uh, okay. I just, uh, uh, I wanted to make a statement. It was well said by Pastor Eddie Williams when he stated that uh, we were known as an honest and trustworthy people, person of a high education, honest, but, but not anymore. So I raised the question is when did we change? And uh, analyzing things, I believe uh, we discussed this in Bonaire a couple of years ago. And uh, that touch and seed, I think it was, that made a powerful statement that all our Caribbean islands, we are sending our kids to the colonial government to get them educated. So what can we expect when they return? And I remember that Colombia is in first place worldwide as the most corrupt country. And that is where we are sending our children to be educated. So that's why we have so many of our young men and young women in the line of uh, high corruption. So I will want to 
to ask if there is any possibility for the Caribbean universities to open their doors to help us uh, offer a different type of education to our children so that whenever they return home, they will return still as being Sanandran or Providentian or being an honest person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that commentary. And it raises a very powerful question that I'm sure any one of us on this panel, everyone has been providing responses in that regard because education has been highlighted as well as economics have been highlighted. Displacement around colonialism has been highlighted and a number of other human rights violations and the ways in which we can, as I said earlier, not just demand it, but to make it a decree, like this is what we say it's gonna be and we make it so. And you, we have to be able to put that kind of strength in action in all of the things that we're saying and doing. Cause it's not easy to approach many of the Caribbean universities because most of them are financed by the same colonial entities that want the educational system to be in the form that it's in. And many times some of the educators that do go above and beyond to teach a more holistic, culturally appropriate, historically accurate history, culture, values, traditions to our students, young or not so young, we tend to get kind of pushed to the side. And it's another layer of warriorship that we have to engage in to be able to even teach what should be taught so that our future generations can come and give back and follow through in the way that's most respectful. But before we get ready to close, are there any other questions? I just would like to make sure that we've addressed any other questions or any other final commentary that anyone would like to share. Don't jump all at once. Grr, hmm, okay. No one has anything else to ask? No one else okay. has anything? Yes. Hello? Yes, thank you very much, Sister Queen Devika. Okay. <laughs> thank you for all the tactics. Okay, I just want to say a quote um, to end this evening. Uh, the society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting by fools. In other words, I live by this, 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 this quote. We should unite as activists and intellectuals on a common goal. So that's what I just want to say tonight. Thank you. Fantastic. I think with that being said, I will return the virtual lectern back over to the MC of the evening like no other the illustrious honorable brother Sydney, please. I think we exhausted our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tenzira. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a, a short Q&A, but we understand um, we are now at 6.43. Um, I will um, give the mic symbolically to Mr. James Finnis for some closing arguments as we are we are going to the to the end of our conference. Mr. James Finnis, the mic and the floor is yours. Ours. Okay. Our sister board, we need to continue with forward. Um, yes, ours. Before I continue close, Dr. Carbon, um, before we leave, you follow the whole afternoon. You are our once a mentor. You have a guidance in this thing. And we're willing to move forward at all costs. We have to work for us, then I go to the close. Carbon. 
on me. Yes, good, good afternoon. You have given me a high honor in your words. We know each other for many years and uh, I, I appreciate that very much. Now we have come together uh, again through your direction and your involvement and sophistication and clear mandate to bring us from English speaking, French, Spanish, Dutch, Papiamento, French Creole. We have it all, all of our linguistic flexibility, linguistic activity and acumen uh, from the northern part of South America to the northern Atlantic. We are, the again, we're the remnants of the of, of colonialism, we're the remnants of empire, but we, we will not give up the fight and we will continue onward. Uh, we, we must again, maintain our cohesiveness. Uh, we, can, we have tools now, we could use this tool, but one day we, soon we'll be meeting in person and to, to reinforce what we are doing, but we need the guidance, our guidance, but we also need the support of our, our brethren and sisters from the wider region. So the extent to which we focus on that amongst our internal discussions that we have in our own territories and recently, we broaden it to the, include the independent states so that they understand that without us, their, their, their move toward full regional integration ca cannot simply succeed. Uh, we are well, we're part of one, one whole. So that to that degree, we need to focus on that. And you, I know James and Avika, Sydney are focusing on this quite a bit. And, and this is part of uh, what we must do. I'm very happy to see uh, Dr. Arundel, who I don't see enough of. And, uh, and, and Charles, of course, uh, Interestingly, I'm, wor I'm working with uh, some folks in um, Stacia on a book which will be coming out and we're focusing on the implications of the, at least my chapter will focus on the implications of the 2014 referendum. Uh, that they run up to it, how it was conducted, the machinations which took place in relation to uh, the result. And, and then of course, uh, the courage ex expressed and displayed by the, the Island Council in subsequently, when they after the election in 2015 to accept the results on the basis of the will of the people. Of course, uh, this is just, this was the beginning. Apparently there's been some delay, but you know, it's not over. And we will help, we will do what we can do to ensure that the will of the people is, is understood. Um, generally speaking, um, you know, I, as, as Charles said, uh, I, I like to say, in, I say it in Tahitian, uh, which is a, a general, generalized Polynesian phrase, which means simply stay strong. And that is my message to all of us as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carbon. Thank you for that nice encouraging word, yes. We will stay strong, we will keep moving forward. So with that, um, I think we come to end of another historic day. Yes, our sixth, yes, our sixth. And we'll continue till we get it done. That's what we set out to do. So um, thanks, many thanks to Sydney. Sydney, thank you so much for uh, guiding us today. Of course, we need you to keep us together and keep us going. Dr. Shan Zira on the other side, Dr. Shan Zira, many thanks. Tulsi, behind the scenes there. Tulsi, many thanks for assisting us today. And Piel, um, our side, a young Bonarian who's come to venture in some uncharted water. Uh, he's very alone in this field. Uh, first time a Bonarian venture in this, in this type of thing. We're very proud of him, a young Bonarian. And most thanks to Davika. <laughs> if you know anything happens, it all happens without Davika. <laughs> Everything happens is 
by to the Vika. So she's a really strong hold from us uh, on our aspect. So the Vika, thank you for another time to uh, push this so we get it done. And thanks, but thanks to all our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean. I see Rhoda, Rhoda, thank you. We will keep fighting Rhoda, stay with us. We know we, we take the steps one by one, but we will get to there, Donna. Keep, I okay. like you because you say clear. You are one of few can say clear out there. Yeah. And I keep saying, Rhoda, we will support you all the way with that. Keep going, Rhoda. Yeah. Then, Lodeska, thank you, Lodeska. Stay with us. Lodeska was the first one who came to Bonaire. And the first time we heard about San, San mm -hmm. Andreas and the Rizal people, and we hear directly everything happening there. It's happening here, so it's not we're not it's not a Caribbean thing. It's a it's a one thing they do it with all of us. The same thing. So then um, Charles for course, Charles is a fighter. He does you hear him? He will keep fighting because they know what the fight is about. It's not about temporary things. It's about the final thing. We fight Charles, and then also Maurice. Thank you, Maurice, to be with us. We will keep together, Maurice. Keep fighting. I see you protest. Keep protesting. You can do it. Do it. Keep protesting. They will listen. But we'll keep with you all the way, Rolis. We'll get to that, Rolis. And also, um, Corina McNish leave. But um, today, Eddie, thank you, Eddie, for um, bringing you nice force inside. Thomas uh, from Bermuda, he left, but we still thank him because he. It's courageous to join us and tell the truth and very clear on how we think we should move forward. Thank you for being with us. And, and also to our first time we have experienced Mrs. Allen from Pausa Prome. Thank you. We hear you. And if you what you said, we stick with it, we get out of this because we need each other to move out of there. So we thank you so much. And to Renee too in the background, Renee, thank you for keeping um, sticking with us because we have one road to keep going. We will keep going. And because now I think as Dr. Carbon said, and we are on the road, it's a one way, it's a wave, yes, in the Caribbean, the wave of reparations, right? Barbados with this, with this, um, Republic, the reparation wave, we as a de undecolonized countries, still colonies should force the Caribbean. I say force because I have to say it as it is, we have to force them to understand that will be no free Caribbean or no integrated Caribbean or no reparation in Caribbean if we are colonies. So they have to hear us because if if I'm happy, we are so happy that this move is, movement is going on in the Caribbean now, but that reparation movement should lead to a free Caribbean. And we, are, we should be as free and also be as all of them. So that is, um, I think with that, we will be closing and let's all, all keep, keep it up and keep bringing the message out that we have the right to be free as any other people in this world. And with that, um, we will see each other next time. Thank you. Good night. Have okay. a nice night. Bye. 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 Keep strong. Keep strong. Keep fighting. Bye.